I think that we have these kind of preset narratives about a place, about people. And, you know, we have that in policy and politics as well, right? I think a lot of folks have tried to squeeze this conversation into like, you either think that people's safety is a priority and you want more police, or you think we live in a utopia and you don't think we need police, right? Like that's been the binary of this conversation when like, that's not the truth. And, you know, I don't fault people. It is incredibly difficult to tell the truth when you have these preset narratives and the truth isn't fitting into any of them. You, you, you know, people feel like you're not really making sense. My whole goal, especially in this moment, is to make sure that I'm telling the truth, right? And the truth is that we do need to have a conversation about how we keep each other safe as neighbors. I think that if there were more opportunities for folks to engage in a more long-form conversation, that's how we're actually going to cook up a solution. That's Jeremiah Ellison, and this is The Rich Roll Podcast. The Rich Roll Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. So today's going to be a little bit different. As some of you may know, I spent the week of April 13 in Minneapolis, a very tense Minneapolis. And I think it's fair to say it was a rather historic and, and personally a very moving week in which the eyes of the world bore witness to both the death of Dante Wright and the tail end of the Derek Chauvin trial. And it was also a week in which the world was grappling with what these events mean, what they portend, not just for the current and future of Minneapolis, but for the civil rights movement, for the broader relationship between government, power in general, and citizenship in our country at large. And the reason for this trip, the motivation behind it, the intention, the goal was to better understand the circumstances that led to consume this city and in many ways, the nation, not from what I read or saw streaming endlessly on cable news, but rather from a firsthand perspective, a boots on the ground experience. And at the same time to conduct meaningful, nuanced conversations with civic leaders of Minneapolis about the important issues the city and its citizens are grappling with from police misconduct and public safety reform to civil unrest. And of course, the role social activism has played in all of this. So that is what today's conversation with Jeremiah Ellison is all about. The first in a series of Minneapolis themed episodes that I will be releasing over the coming weeks. As both an activist and elected official, Jeremiah represents Ward 5 on the Minneapolis City Council, where he sits at the vortex, the intersection of the many challenging and complicated issues that concern his community. And from the start, this is a guy who's been one of the leading and most prominent voices calling for the overhaul and reimagination of public safety. There are a few important things I wanna add before we dive in, but first. We're brought to you today by Bowl & Branch, taking your sleep experience to the next level in comfort and sustainability. You guys probably know I'm all about ethical product optimization from food to everyday essentials. The thing is, knowledge is power. Understanding how your products are made, by who and why is key. And when it comes to bedding, Bowl & Branch is just, it's the best out there. Bowl & Branch is super open and transparent about their manufacturing process. And they are the first fair trade certified manufacturer of linens. Their factory workers are treated right and paid fairly. And this is not greenwashing. To date, their sustainable processing has saved 21,252 metric tons of carbon emissions. No fast fashion factory BS. Not to mention the sheets are sublime. They're buttery soft, lightweight, breathable, sustainably made and built to last. In fact, they actually get softer and cozier with every wash and they come at a fair price. Their signature hem sheet set comes in an array of gorgeous colors. I rock the silky dune color in my tent. So one question, are you ready? 
Feel the difference quality makes at bowlandbranch.com. Get 15% off your first set of sheets when you use the promo code RICHROLL at checkout. That's bowlandbranch, B-O-L-L-A-N-D, branch.com, promo code RICHROLL. All right, well, now for some bad news. The world is full of uncertainty, and that might leave you feeling a little stressed, a little anxious. But the good news, you can navigate change, feel more relaxed, and quiet your mind with Calm, the number one mental wellness app to give you the tools that improve the way you feel. Clear your head with guided daily meditations, improve your focus with Calm's curated music tracks, Personally, once I'm tucked in, I'm a big fan of queuing up one of Calm's sleep stories. Just last night, I drifted off to the legend Idris Elba telling me a sleep story about trekking across the mountains of Lesotho. And right now, if you go to calm.com slash richroll, you'll get a limited time offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of programming and new content is added every week. Over 100 million people around the world use Calm to take care of their minds, sleep more, stress less, and live better with Calm. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash richroll. Go to calm.com slash richroll for 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library. That's calm.com slash Rich roll. Okay, Jeremiah Ellison. So I should point out that this trip came to be through many conversations with my friend Brogan Graham, one of the co founders of November Project, who you may recall from episode 277 of the podcast way back in the day, and who, as a resident of Minneapolis, was keeping me apprised of the temperature and goings on there and suggested that I come out and see it for myself. I have done plenty of podcasts on the road over the years, but this particular situation presented a unique set of circumstances to experiment with expanding the scope of of what this show has traditionally focused on, which is evergreen conversations, and instead pursue a sort of investigative journalism perspective on an important current event unfolding in real time. Brogan did not need to implore me to come. I immediately jumped on it as an opportunity to try something new with the podcast, an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to learn and share to the best of my ability, my sense of all of it. So that's the backdrop. As for Jeremiah, he's a guy who was at the very top of my list of people to host. And one of the many interesting things about this guy is that on the one hand, he's a very unlikely politician or civic leader because in addition to being quite young at heart, this guy is really an artist. He paints street murals, he pens comic books, he's really into the Silver Surfer and Batman. But on the other hand, he is the son of six-term Congressman Keith Ellison, who is now the Attorney General for the state of Minnesota, and the man who was in charge of the Chauvin prosecution. So you can easily also make the argument that Jeremiah was actually born for the role he currently inhabits. My week in Minneapolis was extraordinary. There were so many experiences I will never forget. I learned a ton. I'll be sharing much more about it on the next Roll-On episode and other content that we're currently working on. And I'm, I'm better for the trip. And Jeremiah actually has a lot to do with that. I'm grateful that he took the time to share his truth and for his trust in my ability to share it with all of you. And the result of our time spent together produced what I believe to be a rather powerful exchange. My only ask is that you welcome him and his testimony with an open mind and an open heart. So here we go. This is me and Jeremiah Ellison. Once again, man, I appreciate you doing this. Yeah, I appreciate the invite. It's almost nine o'clock at night. <laughs> Usually I do these at like I'm, noon. I'm just waking like up. I, keep my, I know I'm like, I hope my energy, <laughs> I can keep it going. Um, 
But the reason we're doing it at night is because we're, well, Ramadan just kicked off. So you're yeah. fasting. So yep. you just broke your fast. The meal, what's the meal called? Uh, iftar. Yeah, iftar, yeah. Iftar, right? Yep, yep, yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. So I, I broke fast just real quickly because I knew I needed to make it over here. But like, yeah, two dates, two oranges, like half a gallon of water. <laughs> uh, that's not, yeah, because you can't drink, you don't drink water either. Yeah, 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 yeah. Day. Like I'll have like, I'll go home and I'll uh-huh. eat again after this, but I'm like, right. I'm like, I can't like cook right yeah, now. You have like a big tight. food coma right, right before you come over here too. <laughs> right. Have you been doing that your whole life? Uh, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yep. Yeah. I can't remember how young I was when I started. Um, you know, I, I wasn't five, like some, you know, some, some kids in the faith, they like, we'll start that young. Right. Um, I don't think I was that young, but definitely like middle school, high school. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. It's cool, man. I like the tradition. Part of the tradition is, well, it's about, is it not about kind of self-reflection, like introspection, yeah. and like humility. restraint, mm-hmm. humility, which are all interesting kind of states of mind as mm-hmm. we're in this crazy moment here in your city. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the I feel like for a long time, um, Ramadan for me was just fasting. Like it was just the hunger. Uh-huh. You, you get to, you, when you're young, especially you're going to fixate on the not eating part because you're not eating. It right. sucks, you know, for a whole month. Um, and, uh, you know, somewhere in my early 20s, I had like a, I don't know how to describe it, but like the, the end of Ramadan, like I just felt something different. Like I just felt like I was taking it on differently. Mm-hmm. It was no longer just about like an exercise of like, you know, it's, uh, you know, this, this, uh, you, you can turn fasting into a sport, right? Like, mm-hmm. can I get through the day, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and so yeah, the the humility, you know, fasting from from anger and some of these intangible things are like really become the goal. They really become uh-huh. the focus for me. And the food part is like it's it it, it helps, you know, uh, it helps uh, direct it. direct that. Yeah, but yeah. it's not the point, right? You're you're purging your you're you're detoxifying yourself of these negative emotional states. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it's a spiritual, you know, sort of journey that you go on for a mm-hmm, month, right? Mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. that kind of squarely places you in a deeper connection with yourself. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And it's communal, you know, right. like it's not eating can feel deeply individual, <laughs> you yeah. know, but, um, but the practice is communally. You got millions of people all over the world, but then even more immediately, you know that you've got like neighbors mm-hmm. down the street, like, uh, um, there's a masjid on the other side of the block from where I live. It's not the one I go to, but you know, it's always kind of fun to see right. like, you know, folks gathering together uh, to, to break fast, um, do iftar together. Uh, some people spend all, all night, you know, mm-hmm. at the masjid praying and it's, it can be pretty cool. And what happens, so like May 15th is the end, right? So what happens when you finally conclude it? Yeah, I mean, uh, usually, I don't know what we'll do I did get my second uh, vaccine shot, so I'll have to see where family's at and uh-huh. how, if everyone in the family's got. My sister's gotten it. Um, my brother's a nurse, so he's gotten it. So I think most of us are might be fully vaccinated by Eid, and yeah. um, so, so hopefully we can do it together. Right. <laughs> yeah. So well, uh, you you have a fascinating story. Um, the more I kind of dive into everything that you're about, the more interested I become. And you're a bit of a conundrum because on the one hand, you're just such an unlikely politician. Like you're a street artist, you're a comic book artist. Mm-hmm. I wanna see your comic book art. You didn't bring any comics. <laughs> no, I didn't bring anything with me, no. <laughs> um, so on that level, like, how does this make sense? And yet, as the son of your father, Keith, six term congressman, mm-hmm. um, now attorney general and kind of leading the prosecutorial team in the Chauvin trial, it's like, of course mm-hmm. you're doing this. It's like you're following in your father's footsteps in your own unique way, bringing your own kind of imprimatur to, to what it is that you do. But how do you think about this? It's like, you didn't show up in a, in a, in a tie, you know, no. you got a beanie on, you're rocking <laughs> tats, you know? you're a man of the people, but you're, you're, you're first and foremost an artist. Yeah, I, I like to think so. Um, you know, I have been painting and drawing my entire life um, you know, if my dad were here, he would talk about, you know, that my parents trying to figure out how to channel my, my artistic impulses. Uh-huh. Cause you know, we, I grew up in this old house and the, the wallpaper would peel back. And so I was just like the kid that's like, okay, I'm going to peel the wallpaper back, draw something little and uh-huh. put it back up. Um, 
but I feel like the way that I came into art and uh, and and my practice in general, especially mural painting, you know, um, it really connects. It 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 really overlaps with the way that I govern in a really important way. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll I'll say this quick story. And uh, but when I was eight years old, I got involved with this organization called Juxtaposition Arts. Uh, and Roger Cummings and uh, Peyton Russell were my art instructors back then. And I showed up to the first day of mural painting, eight years old. I'm really excited. The next youngest person was 14. Yeah. So I'm the youngest person there. I'm really excited to paint this mural. I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to get my hand on a spray can. They had spent all winter making me do still lifes, you know, so I could do the ba- uh-huh. get to the basics. And I'm like, no, nah, I want to be a graffiti <laughs> artist. And, um, and uh, so I show up and I'm ready to paint. And Roger is like, hands me a notepad and a pen. And he's like, okay, I want you to walk, you know, three blocks that way and walk three blocks in the opposite direction. And everybody you talk to who lives in the area, I don't care what they're doing, just ask them what kind of thing they want to see on the wall. Mm. That doesn't mean we're necessarily going to paint it. But, you know, when you are going to make public art, you've got to engage the public. That's the, that's the lesson. Yeah. Um, I was learning that at eight, you know. I think every mural process I ever had incorporated some kind of community feedback. Mm-hmm. And even once you started painting, you know, I remember when I would get older, people would walk by and they would say like, you know, uh, that's whack. Like, I don't like, I don't like how that looks, you know, <laughs> or they would say, Hey, this, this, uh-huh. I'm, I'm interested to see how you finish. Or they give you compliments. Like the community engages, especially on the North side of Minneapolis, the community is going to engage. They're going to tell you if they don't like it. Right. They're going to tell you if they like it. Um, and really what they're telling you is, um, in a roundabout way is whether or not you engage them. Mm. So, yeah, that's a huge life skill and a cornerstone of being an effective politician, right? You have to go into the community, meet these people, meet them where they're at Mm -hmm. and try to develop some consensus around your vision. Like you might think this is what I want to do. They don't want it. How much are you willing to bend and compromise? How can you get them on board with what you want to do? Like all of these are the skills that come into play every yeah. minute of your day now, I would imagine. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, and outreach can be tough, especially as a local elected. You're, you're battling, you know, the fact that, especially in my seat, mm. there's this legacy of not engaging with folks. And so that means that, you know... Uh, the level of people who think to call their their council member when they're having an issue is relatively low. And so right. I go to try to, you know, turn that up. I want people, you know, it might be a little bit weird, but I want people complaining in my office, mm-hmm. right? Like that's how I'm going to be uh, uh, effective in my role. Um, uh, but it can be tough, right, to, to, to get that level of input. Um, I think we've done a pretty good job so far. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Sometimes people aren't quite there with you. Right? Mm-hmm. They're not seeing what you're seeing. Um, and that does present its own kind of like question, right? You can't leave your constituents behind. Mm-hmm. It's just not, it's not the right thing to do. Uh, but you also can't just say, uh, do the wrong thing, make the wrong decision mm-hmm. because you think it'll be unpopular with your constituents. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, 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 that's where you kind of create that, that uh, where you have that tension, right? Yeah. Well, globally or kind of in a macro context, people are so, you know, kind of, um, you know, disabused of any idea that their politicians have their interest at heart. You know, mm-hmm. they're bought and paid for by special interest groups and they're just looking to get reelected and they're going to, you know, pander to their base and anything else is just a mere distraction beyond fundraising, right? Mm-hmm. But you're a guy who kind of um, was foisted into the public eye by dint of the activist work that you did, in particular, that one kind of viral photograph mm-hmm. of you with your hands up and the rifle in your face from the cops. That was Jamal Clark? Uh, was Jamar. Jamar, right. Yep. Sorry. Um, in like 2015, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So this kind of, uh, you know, becomes not really a calling card, but it becomes kind of emblazoned in people's minds that you're a man of the people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then as you become an elected official, there's a blurring line between activism and kind of affecting responsible political change, right? Like Mm -hmm. how I'm interested in like how that works. Like where does the activist end and where does the elected official begin? Do those things kind of merge together or do you have to think of them as, as like separate identities? I think you have to be honest with yourself about what this job can do to people, 
even if they have good intentions, right? Mm-hmm. And if you're honest about, which to be clear, I think usually when, from my experience, when folks are maybe being called like uh, a sellout, right? Like that term or, or, or that process of going from being, you know, okay, I came in with all these ideals and now, you know, maybe I'm a little bit, I've, I've moved into this other category where people aren't really feeling me. Um, I think that that happens because of exhaustion and it happens to people because they think it can't happen to mm-hmm. them, you know? And so for me, it's about keeping perspective and uh, not taking some of, that, uh, some, of the, some of that anger that people might have towards me, constituents or activists or whoever, not taking it personal because I know that there have been people, whether in my immediate seat or just in elected office before, who have uh, earned a lot of the bad will that people have yeah. for politicians, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, so you have to double down on the transparency and the outreach and I the think, boots on the ground in the community. And I think that you also have to, in, in a way, figure out how to be vulnerable. How, you know, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a quality that's rewarded in this position, mm-hmm. right? And there are ways to be sort of faux vulnerable, right? Like, I don't know, crying in public, right? right. Um, and there are ways- Performative vulnerability <laughs> right, on right. social media. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Oversharing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then there are ways where, where uh, to be vulnerable that can earn some good trust and they're real, may not look vulnerable on their face, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there have been times where I have thought something was needed in my community. Like a couple of months ago, I was advocating for a women's homeless shelter and the neighbors were like, council member, hell no, we don't mm-hmm. want a homeless shelter here. And, you know, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, I was, I, I, it didn't prevail, right? Mm-hmm. As much as I wanted it to. Um, I had public meetings where I was just, oh my God, I was just blasted at these meetings. Um, Not in my backyard kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and people with some legitimate mm-hmm. fear, right? Like I think people have been fed a lot of um, gross narratives about homeless people. Um, and uh, it's not my job to judge them for having consumed those messages, but it is my job to maybe do some political education and try to help mm-hmm. them unlearn some of those messages. Uh, and so when I'm looking at somebody who's using criminalizing language for homeless people, I disagree with them. I got to work to make sure that I'm winning and not them, <laughs> but, yeah. um, but I don't judge them, right? Uh, I don't dismiss them because I know in some ways, like what they want and what I want and what that person who's living up, uh, out on the street wants is probably pretty similar. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've just got it. They walked into the conversation with a lot of preconceived notions. Mm-hmm. Now, some of the people who were standing against me in that meeting, I thought, you know, uh, I've lost this person's support, right? Mm-hmm. Not only did I lose this person's support, I, I also, um, you know, um, some of the other electeds who were in the room were looked around, saw me getting yelled at and thought, oh, I'm not going to support it because I don't want to be in his position. <laughs> yeah. and, and then we ended up losing it. it that shelter didn't get built. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, and so it's kind of a setback. But you've got folks who stood against it at the time who have reached back out to say, you know, actually, I see what you were doing there. You have folks who are in the back of the crowd, maybe seeing me get heckled. And, you know, they're just everyday people. They don't want to be heckled mm-hmm. themselves, but they agreed with me. Yeah. And those are the kinds of things that, that can happen when you're willing to, um, you know, uh, go out on a limb, when you're not operating in that mode of what's going to get me liked in this right. moment. Right. So your, your, your district is Ward 5. Uh-huh. It's 82% people of color, yeah. And something like 40% of the population is below the poverty line. Yeah. So this is the, you know, kind of modus from which you're operating and, and the people of, on behalf of whom you're, you're advocating for. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting that even then there's, there's blind spots, like you're trying to champion the underdog, <laughs> but these other underdogs are like, hey, what about me? Like, yeah. it just gets complicated. It does get complicated. Yeah. I think that's why, you know, I think that's why that, like the only th- term I could think of is political ed, like political education mm-hmm. is just, really important. Uh, it can't happen if you're dismissing people. It can't happen if you're condescending people. Um, people are pretty smart, but they are also 
uh, a lot of things on top of that, right? People might be afraid at any given moment. People might um, have not wrestled with their biases, right? Uh, all these things can occur. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I think that's how you, you can find yourself in a position like that. And I know for some of those folks, they thought they're, they're thinking, well, yeah, I'm, I'm poor, right? And this guy, you know, meaning me, wants to quote unquote dump more mm-hmm. poor people in my neighborhood. A limited, and a limited amount of resources into a program that doesn't right. benefit my life. Right, right. Yeah. And you know, it's a scarcity mindset. You know, my mindset is, you know, you, um, you're greeted when you arrive, you're given what you're needed, right? Um, and, uh, and I'm always gonna have that attitude. Mm. And, so, uh, and so I'll continue to make sure, you know, make sure that we're doing our fair share and building shelters, but you know, I can, I can disagree while, while empathizing uh-huh. with someone uh, yeah. who might be advocating for a position that I can't, I can't stand on. Yeah, well, that's your job, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're constantly yeah, 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 dealing yeah. with people that don't see things the way that you do, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, right. I mean, you're, you're like in the shit right now, like mm-hmm. you're in the crosshairs. The entire world is paying attention to what's happening in Minneapolis right now. Um, I would imagine that that must feel at times burdensome to carry that kind of level of responsibility. Um, and, you know, on the, on the subject of political education and boots on the ground, I mean, that's my motivation in coming here. Like everybody else, I've been watching what's been going on here over the last year. This feels like a very important historic moment. We're at uh, a sort of um, crossroads, I think, mm-hmm. with what's going on in the city. And there's what's gonna happen with the verdict and how is Minneapolis gonna move forward or not from this. But I think also because everybody's paying such close attention, the ripple effect in terms of like how we're gonna function as a nation and even across the world, I think has profound implications, right? And I just wanted to share with you yesterday, you know, as somebody who thought they were paying fairly close attention to what was happening here. I haven't been here before. I mean, the last time I visited Minneapolis, I was a kid um, and we went to uh, George Floyd Square yesterday. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, as like this progressive, you know, conscious citizen, I thought I knew what to expect Mm -hmm. and it defied all of that. Like all of that went out the window as soon as I arrived there. And it was nothing like what I thought it would be from the setting to the neighborhood, to the visceral experience of, of being in what is really a living, breathing, not just memorial, but, but museum, grieving place, mm-hmm. uh, gathering spot. Like mm-hmm. it's so many things, you can't define it as any one thing. And I was not expecting to be as moved as I was by it, or as welcomed as I was, we mm-hmm. had an, we had a great encounter with um, the Agape folks. Mm-hmm. You know that group, mm-hmm. um, who then we were we'd spent like an hour there, and then we were getting ready to leave, and they're like, "Hey, what are you guys doing?" And then they ended up like giving us a VIP tour, of, oh, cool. like, you know? <laughs> and it was incredible, man. And and you know, I had a hard time sleeping last night. I was so moved by it, and what it did beyond just that experience in and of itself was remind me of not just my own biases, but how, when I think I know something, I really don't know. Like there's always room to expand and to grow and Mm -hmm. to learn. And I left that realizing how little I actually was connected to what was happening here. Mm -hmm. And just kind of, there's something about the heaviness of it all. Like you can feel the emotion of everybody that's in that space. And so I don't, I don't know if I'm, this is leading to a question. It's more like an observation, like <laughs> yeah. the context in which I'm coming to you today as somebody who you know, is grappling in the political sphere with these issues. Um, how do you, you know, think about how you communicate you know, when you go on Chris Hayes or CBS News and all these kind of things that you've been doing lately? Mm-hmm. I think that we have these kind of preset narratives about, about a place, about people, and, you know, we have that in policy and politics as well, right? I think a lot of folks have tried to squeeze this conversation into, like, you either think that people's safety is a priority and you want more police, mm-hmm. or you think we live in a utopia and you don't think we need police, right? Like, that's been the binary of this conversation when, like, that's not the truth. And, you know, I don't fault people. It is incredibly difficult to tell 
the truth when you have these preset narratives and the truth isn't fitting into any of them. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, people feel like you're not really making sense. My whole goal, especially in this moment, is to make sure that I'm telling the truth, right? And the truth is that we do need to have a conversation about how we keep each other safe as neighbors, as, you know, residents, and mm -hmm. that the police are not the only means for which we can do that. You can have both conversations. You can acknowledge that keeping people safe is a priority without having to sort of dive into these preset narratives about- Right, um, here we go again. We're gonna do the same thing we've always done we've and we keep done. getting the same result. You Absolutely. know, it's like the definition of insanity. So today, we, you know, there's just so people understand, like we're in downtown Minneapolis right now, mm -hmm. National Guard's everywhere, mm -hmm. Humvees all over the place, yeah. you know, guys in uniform. That alarm went off twice. I don't know what that was about. It's just like a pre, <laughs> like, yeah. it's a preset. Like, like it was a sure scheduled, works yeah. or whatever. <laughs> yeah, um, which is funny because it goes off like we're used to like, it goes off every like first Wednesday or whatever. But this one was also a test I was told, but it's obviously it's not Wednesday. So a lot of people were like, right. what is going on? Right. Yeah. I, I, I think to your point about George Floyd Square is that if you are, somebody else from out of town told me that, that, they were just surprised by how residential and low to the ground the whole space was. Cause we right. look at the pictures. I, I imagined like more, a much more urban place with lots of stores, <laughs> lots of foot traffic. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, it's not a suburb, but it's not really the city either. <laughs> yeah, it's and actually there's a lot of nice houses around yeah, there. Yeah, And yeah. it just was nothing like what I had envisioned in my mind. And, and I was walking around believing that what I believed was true for no reason at all, because yeah. all I had seen were images or quick little mm -hmm, video clips, mm -hmm. even the, iconic mural, I was like, wow, it's so small. It's like, <laughs> I was like, I thought it was like, you know, four stories high or something. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's much more grounded, low to the, yeah. you know, it's, 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 it's not this, this large scale. Um, you know, I think that community members that I've talked to will tell you like, yeah, there's, there's always been an element of like violent crime in this area, mm -hmm. right? Well before the barricades, it certainly yeah. existed after I think the barricades. I think that that story isn't as well told as it should be. It's all about kind of what happened, you know, last year and over the last couple of months. Locally, I think that there's tried to be a narrative. Uh, there has there, there have been a few who have tried to push this narrative that the like the place is overrunning with just like it's just rampant violence every day. It's all despair. You know, that's been the narrative mm -hmm. because there are folks who want to remove the barricades. Um, and I'm not saying we can't have a conversation about whether or not we remove the barricades. I don't represent that area. It's virtually on the opposite side mm -hmm. of town from where I represent. But I do think that it, it simplifies sort of this narrative, right? It's either, you know, it's, it, the, it's either a healing space or it's, or it's hell on earth, right? Right. And the truth is that like, it's neither, and we should probably be, be deferring to the people who are there every day and not just sort of creating a little echo chamber of people who are telling us what we want to hear, right? Mm -hmm. Like I can't just go down there. I, I'm, I'm inclined to listen to the activists and the folks who are sleeping out there, right? right? I can't ignore the businesses who are saying, hey, this is hard for us. Right. But you also can't go down there, talk to the businesses who are saying, hey, this is hard for us and ignore all the people who have said, hey, this is a space where we feel like we can um, you know, access some of our power. Here. Yeah. Like I think that you've got to be able to hold some multiple truths. And, and, and I think that leaders in the state have really struggled to hold. Yeah, for hold people that. that don't know, the square is like, I don't know, it's essentially like a, like a little bit more than a city block. And within the, the, the parameters of George Floyd Square are businesses that mm -hmm. are closed down right now. So yep. obviously those business owners would like to reopen. Mm -hmm. The community would prefer that they don't. Mm -hmm. And everybody's got a valid point of view on that. Mm -hmm. And it's super sensitive. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and there's even some of the businesses within there. I'm not, I'm not going to remember the name, but there's a, a woman who has like a, like a hair and nail place and she's like, it's mm, fine. Right. right. But you've got folks who have food services and it's, it's a little harder to move your food, right? Like it's, yeah. you know, so it's, um, but, but cup foods is, that's like the one thing that's open. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cup. I, I, it's, uh, it's one of the, it, it's, it's, high level of resilience yeah. and, you know, corner stores like it, you know, I kind of have a weird, like, you know, appreciation for those, for those kinds of spots. I grew up like mostly going to corner stores, you mm -hmm. know, we've got this, you know, um, people call it a food desert. I think, you know, I've heard the term food apartheid. I think that's probably more yeah. appropriate um, in North Minneapolis as well. 
And, you know, as much as these corner stores, their ownership, the way they operate, it can be problematic, but also um, they occupy space and provide fresh, you know, food, you know, uh, yeah. at least the option for fresh food in places where, you know, grocery stores have have largely abandoned. Yeah, there's no grocery stores. Yeah. And that drives, it just creates a vicious cycle because that feeds the, um, you know, the lack of health in the community. Um, that then of course leads to all these lifestyle diseases that mm -hmm. make you you know, susceptible to everything from COVID to diabetes, to heart disease. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you see George Floyd, guy was like jacked, you know, looked fit, but mm -hmm. the autopsy revealed he had heart disease. He had pretty bad heart disease mm -hmm. at the same time too. So that I look at that and I'm like, well, that's purely a function of food apartheid, mm -hmm. you know, and living in it, you know, coming up in a space like that. Yeah. So. It's April 15th today and uh, the defense rested its case mm -hmm. in the Chauvin trial. Um, Monday, there's gonna be closing arguments. It's gonna go to the jury. Yep. How are you like feeling about all this? Like what's your sense of how this is gonna play out? Yeah, you know, when you're, you know, I, folks know my dad as an attorney. Yeah. Um, but folks might not know, like I've got, you know, uncles, cousins, my my older brother, all attorneys, right? I think when you get raised in that kind of environment around a lot of people who study and practice law, you know, I think the the one thing you learn is to try not to be too overly prescriptive of what a jury's going to do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've I've followed the case. Um, I've tried not to obsess and hyper be hyper vigilant about following the case because mm -hmm. I know that at the end of the day, you know, we don't have control over the outcome out here. Um. You know, I'm I'm interested. You know, I've got a, you know, um, I think in a literal sense, I have no proximity to the case. But obviously, I have. Mm -hmm. You know, people imagine some proximity because because my dad's. Yeah, uh, I mean, what is what what is his role specifically? I mean, he's sort of in charge of leading the yeah I think the prosecution team. Yeah, and I think you know his role. I think is to is to make sure that he's got good people in charge. You know, Jerry Blackwell is probably going to mm -hmm. be pretty well known when this is all said and done, and. And, um, you know, I, I like to think my dad is a pretty good trial lawyer, but I think it's probably been a, well over a decade since he's been in a courtroom. And so his, his role really is to build a good team. And I think, and, and to check in with them to, you know, vet their work, you know, make sure uh -huh. he's seeing what they're seeing make sure he understands what they're seeing. Um, and that he's equipping them with all the tools they need, you know, aside from that. Is he in the courtroom every day? I, you know, I'm actually not sure. Hmm. I've tried to, I've tried for the most part to not get into the details of the case the same way that, you know, I tried to make sure that he's not in the details of like the civil side as we yeah. were dealing with that. Um, because you were involved in negotiating the settlement, right? Right. right. For the family. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a, there's, I think there's a, there's a healthy, well, A, I think there's just, it's just good professional behavior for us to make sure that if there's overlap, that we're keeping it separate, right? Yeah. Uh, but also, you know, I think people kind of imagine me and my dad of having like this professional relationship, but like uh -huh. we, we have a personal one, right? Like, <laughs> like <laughs> I have the same relationship with my dad as anybody has with their dad, right? So, you know, we get together, we're not going to just talk about work, you know, we're going to, we got other stuff going right. on. I read that, uh, cause you're, you're going to run for reelection and your dad was quoted as saying something like, well, I hope he's doing it because he wants it. He's like, my son's an artist, man. Like, you know, I, I hope right. he, did it, only if he wants to do it, because you know, at some point that guy's going to go back to painting murals. Yeah, for sure. For maybe sure. he will, maybe he won't. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I, I that's, that's what I love to do. Um, I think that I'll be, you know, my, my, my impulses will force me back into that eventually. But right mm -hmm. now I really feel like I'm offering something to my community that I, I don't know anybody else could, could step up and offer. Yeah. And, and, and uh, plenty of people would be capable, you know, Right. Um, but who can win an election and who's ready and, yeah. and who, who feels prepared, you know, half of it is feeling yourself prepared. Um, you know, yeah, me and my dad, like uh, the, the last couple of months, I think we've like, you know, football came and went, you know, obviously we talk about a lot of like the context, same stuff everybody else talks mm -hmm. about. Um, but but also spend a lot of time talking about. He's a big fan of like really bad monster movies, like you know, like stuff like unwatchable. Like he really loves like 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 Hugh Jackman's Van Helsing. I, I can't uh -huh. I can't <laughs> I can't understand it. Um, and he's rewatching. You know, I think the when he can. You know, not that he has a bunch of time, but he was telling me he's going to try to rewatch the X Files. So uh -huh. we you know we talked about that type <laughs> of stuff. 
I'm trying to get him to watch WandaVision. Yeah. I don't know if it's his thing. Uh, yeah, it might be too new for him. <laughs> Going back into the X-Files mind, wow. Um, what was that like growing up with him as a congressman? I mean, most of your childhood, he must have been in office, yeah. So he'd had to go back and forth between DC and here. Well, you know, what's, what's weird, you know, I think, I think it was 17 when he was elected. Okay, so you were already. Yeah, so I was kind of up and getting out of the house. And, you know, I don't know too many 16, 17 year olds who really care about what their parents are doing. So I think that he- As a parent of a 17 year old, I can (laughs) promise you (laughs) zero interest. I, I think it took me a long time to even realize like that anybody thought of him as like, uh, like especially important, you know, mm-hmm. cause like, you know, you go to DC to the swearing in and you're there and, you know, and like, and all of that. But at 16, 17, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about football, my, you know, I was playing, mm-hmm. you know, at the time I'm thinking about, you know, whether or not I'm going to, um, recover from my shoulder injury. I'm thinking about girls. I'm thinking about art. I'm thinking about all these other things. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and I think that like at some point it was like, uh, I had like a realization in my early twenties. I'm like, oh, my dad's like kind of like He's people like know. Thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird. Uh-huh. So anyway, but yeah, it took me a while to even realize. And so I think, you know, for my younger siblings, I think it was a little bit more of a thing for them. But for me and my older brother, I think it was like dad's thing for a while. Right. And your mom's a baller too, like director of the board of education. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But they were cool with like, our son's an artist, man. Like, <laughs> let him do his thing. There wasn't a pressure oh, on you to no, go to law school or anything like that. No, 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 nothing like that. Yeah. I think, um, you know, in my household, it was like, you know, love what you do, try to be good at it so that we can brag about you. Mm-hmm. And um, that's, you know, that's kind of it. You know, I, I remember my mom was like one of the, I can't remember how old, it must have been like 12, maybe. Yeah, like 11 or 12. And I wanted like these like Prismacolor markers and they're like $4 a marker. And so, you know, you get a set of 24, it gets pretty expensive. And, um, and you know, they'd always been interested in my art, but I don't think really understood like, I think they kind of thought of it as like, okay, this is a mm-hmm. thing he did as a kid. He's going to grow out of it. And I just like remained really interested in comics, really interested in drawing, really interested in painting. And my mom was finally like, all right, we're going to get this kid these these mm-hmm. expensive markers and, and, and let him go wild. And, um, and, uh, and it was probably a big part of like what kept me in it. Cause you know, like, I think I was getting a little bit like, you know, kind of around that age where it's like, okay, pen and pencil, drawn still lifes. Right. Like this, this is fine. And it's like, oh man, I could do all kinds of things with color and all this other stuff. So they always really encouraged the art making for sure. We'll be back in a flash, but hey, why not a couple words about Public Goods, my one-stop shop for sustainable, high-quality, everyday essentials made from clean ingredients at an affordable price. Public Goods is basically your new endless everything store. They have it all from coffee to toilet paper and shampoo to CBD oil, all thoughtfully designed for the conscious consumer. So rather than buying from a bunch of single product brands, Public Goods members can buy all their premium essentials in one place with one beautiful streamlined aesthetic. They use a membership model to keep costs down and they ethically source and obsessively develop each of their products to be free of unhealthy ingredients and harmful additives, saving you money and time reading labels because who wants to read labels? We just got all these cool cleaning products for the new studio, Castile soap, glass and bathroom cleaner, surface cleaner, which come with concentrated refill packs so you can reuse the spray bottles. It's all very cool. So you gotta give public goods a try. Receive $15 off your first public goods order with no minimum purchase. That's right, these guys are so confident that you'll absolutely love their products and come back again and again, that they're basically giving you $15 $15 to spend on your first purchase. You got nothing to lose. Just go to publicgoods.com slash richroll or use the code richroll at checkout. That's dot com forward slash richroll to receive $15 off your first order. And finally, we're brought to you today by Quip. People like to chew gum, but not all gum is created equal. Some might come in fancy packaging, but is loaded with sugar that can wreak havoc on your teeth. 
But the oral care experts at Quip have made a gum that stands out from the pack, one that freshens breath with a great taste that actually lasts. You guys know my appreciation for Quip's game-changing electric toothbrush, and now they've launched this sugar-free gum. And obviously, gum isn't something you immediately think about when you think about oral health, but this gum, which tastes great, by the way, is actually good for your teeth and gums and shown to prevent cavities when chewed for 20 minutes after eating. You can choose from an array of groovy gum dispensers that'll remind you of the one-click candy you loved as a kid, which makes it, I don't know, kind of fun. And you can chew at your own pace with Quip's custom subscriptions. The more you buy, the more you save. Quip also delivers free brush heads, floss, and toothpaste refills every three months from $5 with free shipping. If you go to getquip.com slash richroll right now, you can get a free dispenser with any refill plan. That's a free dispenser at getquip.com slash richroll. That's G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash richroll. Quip, the good habits company. Okay, back to the show. So the activism comes later. I mean, we mentioned Jamar Clark in 2015, but prior to that, I mean, you, you were protesting here and there, right? Like yeah. you got arrested one time. <laughs> yeah, arrested you over $15. <laughs> um, but was that was that um, 2015 incident like the the turning point? Was that was that like a moment where you're like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna step up and fill some shoes here? I think it was a moment where people in my life kind of thought hey, you're demonstrating some leadership. Um, I had a mentor, you know, uh, who who kind of told me, she was like, I've always, like when you were in high school, I always wanted you to sort of fill this role because people, you know, um, you know, they, they you, I've seen you give people sort of permission in an indirect way, mm-hmm. give permission to do courageous things. Um, and I've just kind of never thought of myself that way. I'm out here, I'm I'm moving through the world trying to paint my paintings and do all that. And even during the Jamar Clark protest, I mean, I was, I was spending most of my days up in my studio and it was the activists who were on the ground at the time who were saying like, Hey, you live here. Um, and, uh, and, uh, we think that it would mean a lot to community members, to your neighbors, if they have your presence. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I would go deliver coffee and, um, and a big part of what kept me in it was, you know, I was in a longer term relationship and my, my girlfriend at the time, she was like in it. She was like, we're going to like, uh-huh. we're going to be at the protest, you know? And so I think I, through that relationship as well, mm-hmm. it was like, okay, cool. Like there's an expectation here and, and, um, and, uh, and, and people are telling me I'm adding some value in 2015. I think it was more like, you know, yeah, a lot of community members, you know, uh, I had actually reached out to the council member at the time, um, Long Yang, and 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 I, I went back and looked at the message that I had sent him recently because I just was couldn't quite remember what I had said, and it was just like this really measured message of like, hey, like I don't expect you to agree with all the protesters out here, but um, you know I'd always had a good impression of him, and I'd seen him run and lose for county commissioner, then he ended up as a council member and as my council member, and I kind of thought, you know, I I I, I don't feel any hesitancy reaching out to you. And I just remember feeling so dismissed, right? Mm. Like couldn't it, like reading the response, I couldn't even be sure if he wrote it. Like I was mm. like, did 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 uh, did his aide write this? And just like, you know. Um, right. But I remember just feeling totally dismissed. And and what I had asked him to do was come out and be with his neighbors. I said, hey, look, no matter how what you where you stand, one of your neighbors was killed by a city employee. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important that you should come show your face. And it was just no, not going to mm. do that. Um, and so that, that kind of, I think triggered a, a, a frustration in me that was like, well, you, you got to at least show up, right? Mm-hmm. Like whether people disagree with you or agree with you, you got to at least show up, whether they call you an asshole or thank you, you got to show up. Right. It's just, it's just important. It's just a part of the job. The citizens of this city are not afraid to call their elected officials assholes. <laughs> <laughs> No, they're yeah. not. No, they're not. Yeah, as, as much as uh, we have this, I mean, you know, Minnesota nice is is a real thing as well. The passive aggressiveness can 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 be can be overwhelming sometimes, but definitely, uh, especially um, especially in the last couple of years, I mean, yeah. folks are going to tell you what they feel, and I appreciate it, even mm-hmm. if I think somebody's wrong. I appreciate yeah. it. Well, that rawness, you know, can lead to the change that you know can change everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
I, I agree. So you end up uh, you end up running in in like 2016. You get elected in 2017, um, and your platforms essentially at the time like it, it has to do with police action, protest, and reform, and workers' rights, housing, environmental justice, mm-hmm. and the like. But you couldn't have imag- imagined <laughs> what you would be in for. No, yeah. no, not not at all. <laughs> I you know I actually spent when I was looking through. I have this spreadsheet of like things that I've authored and things that I've like, uh-huh. you know, tried projects and policy and ordinances, that kind of thing. And um, a little tracker for myself. What's in progress? What have I finished? What have I passed? And all the stuff that I've passed, you know, it's all, you know, in the on the budget realm, it's all economic development stuff. You know, it's helping small businesses buy their buildings, that kind of thing. Um, on the policy front, it's all like housing protection, like renter yeah. protection, that I mean, kind of housing's stuff. such a big deal here. It's a huge deal. You know, I mean, everywhere in the country, you know, you're seeing people get pushed out of urban areas because, you know, there's sort of this, I call it reverse white flight. It's like, you know, people left mm-hmm. um, in the 50s or whatever. And now like their grandkids like all want to come live in the city. And it's fine, but it's driving up home prices, and mm-hmm. there's a lack of ac- like lack of access, and and um, and it's displacing the people who have, you know, been living in the city for generations. And so I, I really want to go tackle that, um, both the economic development issue and the housing issue, because it's like, you know, this area is either going to gentrify or it's going to stay disinvested from. How can mm-hmm. I make sure that neither happen? Right, like that right. we get investment, but that people can stay and keep opting into this place as their home. So that's what I've been focused on, and um, and obviously police and accountability. Exploded. Yeah, and I, it was, I was just like, it, it's a, it was, it's a, it's a focus. Um, uh, but yeah, now it's our inability to wrestle with this um, mm-hmm. for many, many decades. Our inability to really wrestle with this issue is kind of tearing our city apart right now. Yeah, it's tearing the whole metro apart. Yeah, and people will talk Ooh. about Jamar Clark. Um, and people will talk about George Floyd, and they should. Both those people, both those men were killed in this awful way. But people older than me are going to talk about, you know, Tysel Nelson. They're going to talk about Abuka Sanders. You know, they're going to talk about mm-hmm. these other people who, you know, throughout the years, you know, have been killed by MPD. And Terrence Franklin, which was well ahead of my time, but but we didn't settle that case until I was in office. I think mm-hmm. he was he was um, killed in 2012 or 2013. City didn't settle that case yeah. until until like 2020, and so uh, 2019 maybe, and so so yeah, I, I think it's it's a huge issue, and we've got to get it right. And I think that everybody has the mayor, my uh, my colleagues, everybody has an idea about how to get it right, and everybody thinks the other person's wrong, including yeah. me, to be mm-hmm. fair. And uh, and that's kind of where things stand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the at, at George Floyd Square, they do a really good job of of making sure everybody understands that although George is kind of the focal point of that space, it's really about so much more than that. Mm-hmm. And you see all the names painted on the on the street. And then there's the cemetery with tombstones for all of the individuals who have who have fallen at the hands of the police. And it's just it's it's impossible to not, you know, sort of be in denial about the gravity of the problem. Mm-hmm. Right. And I want to get to reimagining public safety because you got lots of interesting opinions about that. Um, but before that, like, let's spend a little bit of time on George Floyd. Like, I'm interested yeah. in, you know, how everything stor- sort of begins to change when that transpires. You know, commencing with like, when did you f- first see the video, and like, how did that all go down in your own life? Yeah, you know, I first saw the video uh, the day it happened. It was I, I was it was at night. Um, I had seen snippets of it like on social media throughout the day, but had never been spending enough time on social media to actually mm-hmm. click the video. And um, and nobody had necessarily called me or, or anything. Like usually I'll, I will have like a lot of calls from community activists about like this happened. So I was kind of like- It's not in your ward. Yeah, it's not in my ward. Right, right, exactly. And so it was kind of like, okay, I'm not really sure what this video is, um, but it's late at night. Nobody's called me about it. Um, but I'll check it out. And uh, I think it was the one I saw what had been like reshared or posted by Eliza Darris, who's an activist here, a local mm-hmm. activist here. He wasn't the one who filmed the video, but he he had this video and he had posted it. So I'm like, okay, Eliza's posting this. Must be serious because I you know take his, his opinion seriously. And I watched the video and I just remember feeling like, 
like just that dread that you feel when as you're as you're mm-hmm. watching him be tortured and um and there's this moment at the end of the video where you know i i just remember and it's been a while since i watched it but they they go to eventually pick him up and he's so limp and at a human level you know like your instincts kick in and your brain's telling you that this person doesn't have any life in them which contrasted you know the call i eventually ended up getting which was oh uh, you know uh oh he 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 wasn't dead in the video he passed later he, you know all this other stuff mm-hmm. right and call from other city officials. I got a call the, from, from the police. Well, the mayor called me first. Uh-huh. I did, and then I I saw later that I had missed a call from the chief somehow, and uh, and I later talked to him about it, and it was like he got bad info, like you know somewhere in the chain, a lot of folks you know bad info just started right. spreading. He wanted to make sure I was I knew what was going on. He gave me the info he had, and it just wasn't the truth. Well, the initial police report didn't even indicate the knee on the neck thing at all. Right. No, no. It's just as they didn't amend that until after the video was out. Right. Right. And so, you know, we've we've been struggling with some problems with MPD even before this happened. Right. Like, you know, there was uh, uh, my second year in office or maybe halfway through my first year in office. uh, Officers got there was a report that. Um, MPD was instructing EMTs to inject people with ketamine, <laughs> whether they needed it or not, right? And you get, you you got these transcripts of people being begging, strapped to a gurney, begging to not be injected against their will, and then being injected, right? Um, and, the idea being, we just need to sedate these people, yeah, by whatever means necessary. I mean, honestly, reading through some of the transcripts that I read, often it would read as this person called me a name I didn't like. This person, it just seemed vindictive. You know, excited delirium is often the the term that's used to, to, to as an excuse to 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 inject people with ketamine. But um, you know, the people who were being injected were often totally lucid. You know, maybe mouthing off, quote unquote, but totally lucid. Mm-hmm. And being injected with ketamine sort of came off as more of a punishment than anything. Yeah. And um, you know, we had this this uh, marijuana drug bust, which. You know, we shouldn't even be bothering with that anyway. But it was so rife with racial bias that the district attorney wouldn't even prosecute the case. And we do not have a progressive district attorney. You know, it was. It, and so, like, these are some of the things that kind of led up to, you know, uh, oh, we had this huge report that you, you guys should look into. The Star Tribune, you know, talked to a bunch of survivors of sexual assault about and talked to them about their experience. And it was sort of this huge exposure of, of like how people felt like they were treated. Not only was their case never solved, right? And that we have this low, you know, we clear uh, like 20% or less of these types of cases, but individual victims saying that they felt totally dismissed or re-victimized mm-hmm. by our, by our mm-hmm. police. And, and does so, that break down by race? Um, I don't remember if, it, if, the, if the report broke down by race, uh, but some of the women were, you know, very... Uh, you know, very public. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's a, like a photo with a, with a number of, of some of the victims who, who felt like they hadn't been given service by the police department, the, that given any kind of sense of justice um, and weren't even, weren't even taken seriously. Right. And right. so these are the issues that we are, you know, that we're dealing with. And they're all sort of these local scandals that like we're dealing with. And each one just notch it. The, the, <laughs> the, the tension just gets ratcheted up. Right. So, you know, it, it's easy to kind of look at Floyd, the Floyd situation and the explosion of civil unrest that followed and conclude that it was all about that Mm -hmm. without really um, appreciating everything that like was leading up to that being kind of a breaking moment for everybody. Absolutely. You know, uh, there was one professor from John Jay College. They have, I'm going to blank on his name, but he, um, He said something to the effect of during one of our council meetings where we were kind of having experts come in and give us testimony. He said something to the effect of if uh, um, if not an insignificant number of people feel like they no longer want MPD as a part of their life, Mm -hmm. that is a reputation that MPD has earned. Right. And so uh, because people don't come to that conclusion overnight, they don't come to that conclusion out of the blue. Mm -hmm. They witness and they experience that nothing else will work, right? Whether it's people who, you know, like Travis Jordan's girlfriend, who, you know, he was somebody who's having a mental health crisis. 
you know, she called the 911 to get help because she thought he was going to harm himself and the police showed up and killed him. Whether it's, you know, um, uh, people who have lost uh, loved ones because of high-speed chases that were like totally irresponsibly conducted. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a feeling from a lot of people here that, you know, they want good public safety service, right? Yeah. <laughs> but they've but been shown over the years. <laughs> yeah, they've repeatedly been shown something otherwise. And, and, and also, you know, not to go too deep down the rabbit hole, but you're also contending with uh, a lack of sufficient culpability for these officers, mm -hmm. the arbitration process doesn't mm -hmm. really seem to do its job. No. So many of these officers get reprimanded and they're back on the streets and there's no real repercussions for that. Right. And so the, the, the ills are so systemic that it leads to that deep level of mistrust where someone like yourself is led to conclude that it's broken beyond repair. So the conversation around reform falls on deaf ears for somebody like you, right? Because it would, it would appear to like the outsider looking in, well, okay, there's problems here, uh, but let's look at what those problems are and like tease them out and solve them. But your position is basically like, you can't do, it's like, it's not, it's not a few bad apples, like Trevor Noah was talking about this on Instagram. It's like, it's not bad apples, it's like the tree is rotten, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, and if you mm -hmm. have a rotten tree, that teasing out of what's wrong really isn't gonna move the needle or solve the problem in any meaningful way. And we've teased out these problems, right? I, I was, um, I was, I was uh, reading something that a friend gave me about you know, all these various commissions that have studied, you know, uh, the various major riots throughout history, right, uh, in America, starting with the 1919 race riots in Chicago, known as uh, Red Summer, 1919. Red Summer happens, and the governor of Illinois at the time puts together the Commission on Race Relations and to study why the riots happened and you know how they were exacerbated, and finds that in large part they were started by the police. And that they were exacerbated by all these inequities and talks about, you know, literally 1919 talks about, you know, uh, we need to end police brutality that will prevent further riots in the future. We mm -hmm. need to uh, have police living in the communities that they work in. Like they give a lot of suggestions that you'll hear people give today. This is 1919. Mm -hmm. and, and how did they move past that or have they not in your I mean, opinion? <laughs> you tell me how many scandals uh, the Chicago Police Department has had since 1919. I mean, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, I will say it's plenty. I would argue that they haven't moved past mm -hmm. it. And I would argue that we haven't moved past it. Uh, I think that ultimately this isn't the problem. You know, we, locally, we do have a problem with this department. But if you zoom out, the problem that we're having with this department is not a problem with only this department. This is a problem that every single city is facing with their departments. It's a matter of a lack of accountability. You can have all the training in the world, but if you're not gonna be held accountable, your training never matters, mm -hmm. right? You can have all the good intentions in the world, uh, but if you know that there's never any accountability, um, then when you fail to meet your good intention, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the system that, we ha that, we, that we've created. Mm -hmm. And we pour tons of money into reforms. I mean. I think that's the one thing people don't understand is that a lot of these reforms cost additional money, right? Whether it's facial recognition, whether it's body cameras, uh, they cost a ton of more trainings. Mm -hmm. They cost a ton of money. And yet the settlement amounts, yeah, here in Minneapolis, but also, you know, there was a, there was a $20 million settlement in Maryland just earlier this, uh, this year, or maybe in, in 2020, the settlements just get bigger. So the cost of the department gets bigger. Mm -hmm. the, the, the behavior doesn't change. The issue doesn't change. The settlements get bigger. I mean, at what point do cities just, are, are we just not able to even afford this model of public safety? Yeah. I think we're pretty much there. Yeah. The heartbreak of George Floyd as sort of emotionally challenging as, uh, as all of this is, has for better or worse kind of foisted you into the into the national spotlight, you go from being, you know, Ward 5 city councilman to suddenly being on national news. And the main thing that you're speaking to is this idea of finding new ways to keep ourselves and our neighbors safe, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this is all couched 
in the vernacular around defund the police. And my sense, and this is, I really want to hear what you have to say about this is, I think defund the, defund the police means many different things to many different people, depending mm-hmm. on who you talk about. Um, my sense is that it's less about like eradicating or abolishing a police force and much more about ending the monopolization of public protection in the hands of this broken system and creating a new public safety kind of program at large of which police are, are but one part of. Yeah. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. Because you're sort of like, is, oh, he, oh, Jeremiah, he's the defund the police guy. Yeah. You right. know what I mean? So like, right. what does that mean to you? And like, where do you stand? And how is that also like, how is, how is your perspective or your position on this evolved over the last year? Yeah. I, I'll say this as I'm, you know, cause right now it is re-election time, right? And as I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm on the phones and I'm talking to people, maybe even more than usual, um, constituents more than usual. And I'm finding that for the most part, and I know this probably surprises some people, but for the most part, um, I'm finding that I still have a lot, plenty of support and that even my neighbors who are not 100% where I'm at, they, um, they are open to the city of Minneapolis spending less money on police. What they're not open to is us spending less money on their overall safety, right? Mm-hmm. Um, to me, that means that Any system that we want that's different than the one we have, we've got to create it. That's the only way that we can bring people along, right? We've got to create it. And so I think for me, the term defund, right? Defund the police. It's a term created by activists, not me, right? Mm -hmm. Term created by activists to generate a conversation. It's definitely done that. It's done that. I mean, it's as provocative (laughs) as it comes. It's generated a conversation but it doesn't have anything to do with governing, right? So um, activists are well within their right to make that call. It's my job to listen to community members and ask myself, in what way can I make this relevant to governing? And the way that it can be relevant in governing is that we've got to assess all the ways in which people expect to be kept safe, right? If we are expected by our community, and we should be, to solve rape cases, uh, then we've got to also admit that we're currently not doing that. Mm -hmm. Our current system is not doing that. If people expect that if they have a loved one in the throes of a mental health crisis, that their city is not going to show up and fucking kill that person, Mm -hmm. um, then we've got to create a system that functions that way, right? And if people who who have had a fender bender still want to get a report for insurance, but don't necessarily want to have to interact with a police officer, then we should create a system where that's possible. Yeah, it is interesting because now, no matter what situation you find yourself in, the cops are the only, like 911 <laughs> and it's the cops. So whether it's a paramedic yeah. situation or a mental health problem or right. a simple you know, skirmish that could be you know, managed effectively through some kind of, you know, community, uh, you know, outreach or something like that. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of situations and circumstances in which the police need not be involved, particularly um, in a situation where there's such a level of distrust. Yeah, I mean, I know that the the fake $20 bill, quote unquote, it's it's an alleged fake hundred dollar bill. I don't know if it's ever been confirmed that George Floyd. Where used. is that bill? I have it, no idea. It didn't turn up in evidence. <laughs> did it? Um, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, no, one, no one talks about that. <laughs> but this alleged fake twenty dollar yeah. bill, even if it was real, did it require four guys with guns to respond? I mean, that's not an armed robbery. That's that's not even a heist, right? Like that's mm-hmm. not that's not that's not that's not any kind of um, an emergency that four armed people need to come and address. I think that we've got to have a response. We've got to have a system that can still address that store's need, right? Hey, we're out 20 bucks. If this happens too often, like we're, (laughs) it's not great for us. Mm -hmm. But we also need a system that, I mean, our only way, I, I mean, did that store ever get its 20 bucks back? Right? Like, like, our, we didn't do any sort of remedy for that store in that mm-hmm. moment. All, all the city did, all the police did, was kill George Floyd as a response to this alleged fake $20 bill. Mm-hmm. What pay, public safety need was met 
I think is the question that we've got to ask ourselves. And if the answer is none, and you know, I assert that the answer is none, then what do we need, right? Because the store needed to, needed to needed you know a response for the emergency that they were having or for the incident that they were having, but George Floyd's safety also mattered in that moment. And in our system, we didn't prioritize anyone's safety, but we definitely prioritized uh, sort of a punitive response mm-hmm. to someone we thought might have been creating some harm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, how does that relate to? our kind of parochial notion of what it means to protect and serve, right? Yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, in some communities, likely not all, there was a a date and a time where the police officers were embedded in the community and they were community members Mm -hmm. and they were looked to for guidance and counsel. And they knew, you know, those officers knew the people in the community. That's you know, a far cry from what we have today, which is a pivot in the opposite direction towards these militarized, you know, essentially SWAT teams Mm -hmm. um, that you see increasingly, you know, across the country. But even that that older model where you did have folks who lived in the area, that model never worked for black communities. Yeah, that's why I said kind of parochial (laughs) whether or not that was actually true or not. Right, 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 right. No, fair fair enough. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 um, and, you know, you've got, you got images of not only police starting race riots in 1919, but you know you've got it happening in the 20s and in the 30s, and you know you've got it happening in Harlem and you've got it happening in in LA, right? And so I think that there's this um, the Chicago the trial of the Chicago mm-hmm. Seven is about you know the police starting right. a riot, you know, and so I I think that we've got to vet the whole thing, right? Like I think that you know MPD's been around f- for a hundred and 53 years, you know, I, I think that we shouldn't finger wag at how it functions now and say, well, we, we've just got to address that, right? I think we should maybe take inventory of how the last 153 years have gone, mm-hmm. you know, in total. Uh, and, and, and if we haven't gotten what we needed out of the system, then yeah, I, I, I think that, and, and again, I, I think we haven't, uh, then I don't think it's reactionary. I don't think I don't think 102 years is reactionary to say, I think it's time for a different conversation. Right, right. You're, you, but you're often characterized as reactionary. Yeah I, yeah, I think this movement is, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, there was the moment sometime after the protests were reaching their peak where you, among nine city council members, wanted to amend the city charter so that you could put into motion this kind of Mm -hmm. Department of Public Safety. Right, exactly, which would kind of upend the traditional way that the police operated. Mm -hmm. That didn't pass or it didn't get onto the ballot, right? But it's going to be on the ballot in November, I think. Right, right. Right. So we we, we didn't proceed forward quickly enough to get it on the ballot for 2020. But now not only is there a council amendment, there's a community amendment (laughs) also proceeding forward. The language is pretty similar. There's some, I think there's some key differences. But I think that even if the council had given up on that effort, the community was like, no, we want this. Mm-hmm. And they're going to they're gonna make sure it's on the ballot. Right. And so I think that that, I think that only affirms that this, that this impulse wasn't some kind of Minneapolis city council impulse that you now have, uh, in order to get for a citizen's petition to end up on the ballot in Minneapolis, they have to get, I think, a little over 20,000 signatures. Right. Uh, so now you've got 20,000 20, <laughs> votes that are for certain going to be cast for this thing, if not more, right? You're nearing a mandate from your neighbors, from your residents, uh, when they're saying, uh, even if you don't bring forward this charter change, we will. Right. Meanwhile, uh, you have made some progress, right? There's Mm -hmm. something like $8 million have been redirected to other public safety measures. Yep. there's restricted use on chokeholds and, uh, you know, there's been a raising of the threshold for the use of force. Mm -hmm. There's these violence interrupters, these, mm-hmm. these guys who cruise around in orange t-shirts mm-hmm. and kind of mediate conflict in, yep. in various neighborhoods. This Office of Violence Prevention, yep. right? Out that, of the health department. Right. Yep. So there, there has been some, some kind of movement in the direction that you'd like to see. I'm sure very far from what you would prefer to see. Um, at the same time, you know, the counterpoint would be that that this whole movement has led to an increase in violent crime. And meanwhile, like 200 police officers have quit and 
violence is on the rise. So like, how do you, I just want to give you an opportunity to like yeah. share your thoughts on that or respond to that. Yeah. It's funny. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. He reminded me of this recently. This is before George Floyd even happened. This is before the killing of George uh-huh. Floyd even happened. And when everything started shutting down and all these people started going out of work, uh, he was reminding me that I told him then, I said, you know, look, whenever people are out of work, crime goes up. And I said, crime's going to go up and people are going to ask for more police. Right. That was my prediction then. Mm-hmm. That's how it works, right? I think that, you know, it would be a little out of place for me to say that the unrest from this summer played no role in the increase in violent crime that we had this summer. I don't know. But neither did the police. Yeah. Neither does the mayor. Neither do the people who are making this claim. And what makes more sense and is backed by more evidence throughout history is that when people are out of work, crime goes up. Mm -hmm. We had both of these things happen at the same time, right? You've got uh, communities who are, some communities in Minneapolis who are already poor, becoming more poor. And then those same communities feeling incredibly disillusioned and disaffected by the killing of George Mm -hmm. Floyd, you know? That is going to cause so, a reaction. Yeah, powerful combination. Right. And so, yeah, we've had, we've had this uptick in violence. We've had this spike in violence this past year. But if you talk to uh, a, lot of, a lot of North Side youth, right? I represent North Minneapolis. Um, it's not the only place that has an increase in violence. But when you talk to, but, but a lot of youth have been involved in the violence that, that has occurred over the last year. And... Um, If you go talk to youth directly about what will keep them safe, most of them, I mean, I don't think I've talked to a single teenager, you know, a single person, uh, a single teenager in North Minneapolis who has said, um, the issue is that we don't have enough police. They'll say, the issue is that we don't have anything to do. The -hmm. issue is that people are hungry in their houses. They can't go to school, right? People are hungry in their houses. And they can't get that meal that they would get at school. They can't get that meal they would get in school. Also you know, they're at that age where they want to take risks, they want to be bold, they want to, you know, and and when you combine that with access to a firearm, with access to, you know, with 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 uh with all the all the things that a teenager wants, the desire to feel powerful, mm-hmm. yeah, you're gonna have you're gonna have some And an environment right now where it's kind of like it anything goes. Yeah. You know. Right. Yeah. Then you're gonna have these increases in violence. The other thing I would say is that people would have to also be claiming that there was a rise in violence because of a declaration, right? Because the city council made a declaration. Right. And that that caused a spike in violence. That kid who's perpetrating the the crime has no idea. (laughs) Yes. That's not playing into the... (laughs) That kid is not on my newsletter. You know, know, I'll say that. He has no idea what the city council is, is, is up to. Because we didn't address, we didn't remove 5% of the police's budget until December of 2020, mm. right? And so when you see this, this spike in violence over the summer, what you're witnessing is the old model at work. What you're, what you're witnessing is the status quo at mm. work, fully funded. You know, I think, the, I think the year 2020, Minneapolis Police Department had more money than they'd ever had in, their, in the history of their department. And so we didn't actually even, we didn't even reallocate 5% of their budget until December of 2020. And so, uh, so the argument to me starts to really falter when you actually yeah. examine it, vet it in any, in any way. And what makes more sense is, again, this economic issue conflated with the, the, the pandemic, mm-hmm. people out of school, mm-hmm. all that stuff. Have you looked at, um, do you know this thing, Campaign Zero from DeRay McKesson? You know who DeRay McKesson is? Oh yeah, I know who DeRay is. I don't yeah. know, uh, I will admit, I don't know a ton so about So he's got this, zero. I mean, you know, police reform is one of his big things, but mm-hmm. he started this kind of initiative, nonprofit initiative called Campaign Zero, and it's all about police reform. And they, they took all of these people who've actually studied this and figured out what's effective and what's mm-hmm. not. Because a lot of the things you think would be good actually don't end up translating into any kind of fungible change. Mm-hmm. Um, and they looked at like, what are the things that move the needle? And he come, he's got this website and it's like, here are the 10 things that are actually effective in reforming police. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not really the game you're playing. Like you're, you're playing, you're playing, you're rolling a different paradise right. with this I, whole thing. Right, I, I think that like, I'd be happy to check it out and, mm-hmm. and just make sure that I, it's probably a lot of the stuff that other people are recommending. Mm-hmm. I'll, 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 
I'll say that because a lot of these reforms, they all come out of the same school of thought and they all make the same base assumption. And that base assumption is that policing is the only way to conduct public safety. And, and so I'm not accusing d of that. I, I don't know. I have to check, I'll have to check out his 10 points, but I will say that like, you know, you go through and you look at what people are saying today and you look at things that came out of, you know, the McCone commission or the Kerner commission, or, you know, or, yeah. or any of these things that, that, um, any of these uh, studies that came out of mm-hmm. these riots, and they, they've been making the same recommendations in the Illinois um, Commission on Race Relations. They've been making the same recommendations for 100 years. And so um, my question is, what, what, uh, what other than policing would work? you know, to achieve yeah. our goals. I well, think that was that's the one where... thing that, that you talked about, this idea of the police having a monopoly on public safety. And and I got to admit, like, I never really thought about that before. I was <laughs> like, they do have a monopoly on that. Like, and why is that? Is it supposed to be that way? Should it be that way? I never asked myself that question before. Right. But the idea that it doesn't need to be that way, and perhaps mm-hmm. there is a different way. Right. The only thing that I can think of that resembles that in any regard, I mean, I lived in New York City in the late 80s and I remember the guardian angels everywhere, like Mm. on the subway. And Mm -hmm. it was kind of like this community-based, you know, mediation squad Mm -hmm. who was there to kind of diffuse any kind of conflicts that would occur. You wanna talk about defunding. Those kinds of efforts have popped up over cities, right? Like whenever cities at peak crisis, they employ these kind of efforts, right? They hire people that maybe used to be in a life of violence, but have, mm-hmm. you know, have right. reformed themselves. It's usually, yeah, those guys. And it has an impact, right? It might take a year or two or three, but it has an impact. And then as soon as they're, as soon as crisis averted. They go away. They go away. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and it's because, you know, it would, we always sort of view those kinds of things as sort of tag-ons, right? right. They're like band-aids. Me- mediate, right, exactly. But to me, What's more common, right? I guess I'll, I'll pose it as a question. What's more common? A domestic situ- dispute between pe- between couple, right? Or a dispute between neighbors or an active shooter situation? What's more common, right? Well, it probably depends on the neighborhood, but probably, <laughs> you know, probably, uh, you know, the, the domestic dispute situation. Right. Yeah. What's more common that somebody is um, maybe having some kind of um, mental health emergency, right? Whether it's, whether it's, you know, severe depression, they're, they're going to take their own life, whether it's paranoid schizophrenia, they didn't take their medication, whether, you know, they have a trauma and they're tri- they get triggered, mm-hmm. right? Or are a bunch of, you know, heavily armed guys on the freeway going to gonna march down and just start indiscriminately yeah. murdering everybody yeah, in sight? Yeah. I mean, yeah. what's no, more I get common? it. Yeah, I get it. I and get, yeah, and I get so, it. so to me, like to have somebody, to have like uh, someone in a mediator role, to have someone in like a, uh, who's a mental health specialist, it just makes more sense for that to be more of a staple. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that, you know, there's no role for guys with guns in the, the right. in our but current. There, there just should be more tools in the toolbox, basically. Yeah, there should be, right? Yeah. Not everything needs to be. So what does it look like? Like if you had your druthers, the ideal scenario mm-hmm. that could play out in this city, forget about politics. Like sure. here's, the, here's, the, here's what I would like to enact that I think would solve these problems. Yeah, well, you know, I think that, you know, my prag- my pragmatic brain sort of kicks in and I'm like, well, nothing would be like ready tomorrow at scale. But that even that aside, right? Um, the Office of Violence Prevention, we established it in 2018 with half a million dollars. Now the office has- Seven million, I think is the budget. Um, I think it's 2.5. I think you, I think what I read, I could have it wrong, but um, 2.5 got directed towards it so that, Amped up the budget to seven. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, I'll vet that. I'll, I, yeah, you, you might be right on that. So it's exponential growth, but whether it's two point five or seven million, that is that pales in comparison to what it was one hundred and seventy. Mm-hmm. Right, one hundred seventy million is what we give the police. Right, mm-hmm. what we've set aside to build our uh, mental health program is a couple million dollars. It's it's going to go very far. It's going to help get that jumpstart that program and hopefully integrate it into our 911 system so it doesn't have to have its own long seven digit number and all of that. But whatever their budget is, it's gonna pale in comparison to that 1.7 million. To me, I think that we need to be in a constant state of evaluation of what do we need an armed force for, right? When, do, when is use of force actually appropriate? When- And who gets to make that decision? And who gets to make that decision? 
When- but also shit happens too, right? That would be the counterpoint. But you can back that up with data, right? Like you can have, you can have, I think it was like the New York Times that put out this thing that like police spend about 4% of their time actually in, in engaging in, mm-hmm. in a violent situation, right? 4% of their time. I'm not saying that you need to reduce your, what your police do all the way down to 4% of public safety. But what I'm saying is that I do think that it's worthwhile to examine reality, right? You can, you can run hypotheticals until your brain is tired, right? You can say, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? Mm-hmm. What if blah, 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 blah. And what I would say is that like, um, when have the police ever met that public safety standard that they say they're meeting, right? When have they been successful, right? I can point to a lot of situations in which not only did the police mess up, but they weren't even successful. They weren't even successful in meeting any public sa- safety mm-hmm. standard at all, right? And so I think that how do we avoid that, right? How do we avoid not meeting any public safety standard at all? I think it's worthwhile to ask ourselves, and I, I, think, it's, I think it's totally fair to say, how did X scenario go? Right. How does X scenario usually go? Whether it's a, a, a mental health crisis response or domestic response. And, and ask yourselves, are the police having an effect here, a positive one? Are they meeting any sort of public safety goal that we have mm. right, as a city? And if the answer is yes, but they could use some improvement here and there, then great. If the answer is no, then we should probably develop a different strategy. Mm. You know, I think that what we're experiencing is that you have a whole bunch of people that say it's not even fair to ask the question. It's not okay to even ask the question. Right, the question's dangerous. It's, it's fascinating because everything you're saying makes really good sense. And it's crazy that, that it's such a delicate subject and so difficult to just sit down and rationally walk through it. Because I think, I think in part that is perhaps informed by just you know, sort of rash, impulsive reactions to the idea of messing with the police force at all. And I don't think it's helped by, like we all saw the video of Mayor Fry, you know, being asked like, are you gonna, you know, are you gonna mm-hmm. defund the police? And he said, well, if you mean abolish the police force, like I don't support that. And mm-hmm. it was in the middle of a huge protest mm-hmm. and they said shame and he had to kind of walk through this crowd. Mm-hmm. And it's it. like, okay, like you and him have different opinions on all of this, mm-hmm. but but what you're saying isn't like a yes or no question, are we abolishing the police department? Like this is a well thought out nuanced perspective on improving public safety Mm -hmm. that is comprehensive and involves the police in appropriate circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. How dare you? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, and because you are like, it's like, oh, Jeremiah, he's the, he's, de, he's the defund guy. Yeah. You stay away from that guy. Yeah. You know, that's narrative. Like, that's, that's narrative for you, though, right? Like, there are people who feel like they would benefit politically if, if they could prevent people from hearing me ask the question. Mm-hmm. And um, you're, you have, you don't have that many opportunities to kind of talk on and on like we're doing here. It's, no, it's in sound bites. It's, it's inside, two minutes super quick. here. Yeah. And if you don't nail it, like they're going to, they're going to, you know, sort of position you however they feel like or mm-hmm. whatever is going to get the most clicks. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. And, and I've accepted that. You know, you, you talked about like, I started off this whole thing as the council member for the fifth ward and now I'm, you know, I'm getting public interviews. Mm-hmm. I, I would say I'm still the council member for the fifth ward. And, the the only thing that matters to me, right? I'm interested in these conversations because quite frankly, I think, you know, um, it just kind of sharpens my ability to talk about it. And I'm gonna, you know, take some lessons from this mm-hmm. conversation and I'm gonna apply it to my conversations on the phones with people, with my neighbors who I'm talking about this stuff with every single day, right? But for me, the work is not conversations like this one. It's great to have it. It's great to, have, you've got a tremendous platform and, and I, I appreciate the way you're using it, right? But for me, I'm the council member of Ward 5 here in Minneapolis. And I don't have to convince anybody on the news. I don't have to Mm -hmm. convince people in St. Paul. I don't have to convince people on the coast. I don't have to convince Congress. You know, uh, I've enjoyed this conversation. I really like you. I don't have to convince you even, (laughs) right? No, you don't have have to do anything. (laughs) You don't have to show up here. But I would say that, yeah, you have to convince your constituents. Constituents, and I got to convince my if colleagues. Con- if your constituents t- flip on the news, sure. and they're like, well, he seemed like a nice guy when he came through yesterday, but I'm, now he looks like a crazy person sure. you know, here, like I'm not so sure. Yeah, 
I, luckily, I haven't gotten that feedback. Mm-hmm. And I know it's, I know it exists out there, and I know that there's there's those narratives. But I mean, I, I guess I'm lucky enough. To what have, is to have the it. what is like the question that you wish you got asked in those interviews, or what is the confusion? if there is any that you would like to clear up or that frustrates you when you see those news pieces? You know, when we just got done now talking about kind of the nuances of how you execute a call to, how, how a, call, a broad call to action mm. gets sort of channeled and interpreted into governing, that's the kind of conversation I wanna be having, right? Because it's the kind of conversation that I'm gonna have to have one way or another if I wanna get anything done. Right, um, these are it, not binary, you know, situations. They're not. and. And I can appreciate that, like, you know, some conversations are going to be three minutes, right? And that I've got to be able to have a three-minute response that is at least approximate to the 90-minute conversation I'm, I'm, I can have, right? Mm-hmm. But I also think it's important that these conversations not get reduced to the three-minute response. It's much easier to say, you said a thing in public, and then crime went up. It's stupid, yeah. but it's much easier to say than to have this conversation about what actually drives up crime, like what the, the impact of the pandemic and the economic crisis have had mm-hmm. on safety. It's easier to say um, it's easier to say that, but then you have to ask yourself: Well, crime also went up in New York and Chicago, and you know, cities in Arizona, and mm-hmm. you know, and then you have to say: Is that the is that the city of Minneapolis? Is that the Minneapolis City Council's fault too? Or, you know, like then 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 it's like you know, am, am uh, you know, now you're giving me, you know, sort of the kind of power that nobody actually has, right? And so, uh, and so, you know, that doesn't really make any sense. But it's easier to say, and you can say it in a short amount of time. It's harder for me to say, how do you go about this? How do you turn this into governing? Mm-hmm. I actually can't quite answer that question in three minutes, mm-hmm. right? I can answer what we've done in three minutes, but even then, I can't really get into the details, right? Uh, you know, 5% of their budget, $8 million to, to these things. It's important, and I should say it, but yeah, I think that if there were more opportunities for folks to engage in a more long-form conversation, that's how we're actually going to cook up a solution to me. And if people could, you know, I guess I'll challenge myself to help people not have such short memories about what has happened Mm -hmm. in the past, because I think that plays a role in it too. Mm -hmm. The only way that you could be accused of being reactionary for questioning a 102-year-old conversation that has not moved one inch in those 102 years is if people have consistently had really short memories about these kinds of incidences, uh, the impacts that they've had, the tragedies that they've caused. Um, And so, you know, I've I've gotta be patient with people and help them not have such short memories. Right, right. So at the same time, you must have some kind of game plan in the event that um, Chauvin gets released and it and is not convicted, right? Because the city is going to spark. Like, do you have a sense of of how you would respond to that? You must have thought about that, of course. You know, in the um, during the summer, you know, when there was just you know the unrest kind of just dragged on and on and on. There was. Uh, uh, there were groups of neighbors who sort of, some armed, some unarmed, who decided to sort of engage in their own sort of patrols, right? Sort of like an amped up, you know, neighborhood watch type Mm -hmm. thing. And myself and council member Philippe Cunningham noticed that not all of the groups knew each other and that we didn't want groups who were armed and maybe driving around or, you know, so like coming into conflict with people who li- literally live a couple of blocks from them. And so we, so we tried to play sort of that connective tissue. Mm-hmm. I was out doing patrols myself and people knew that they could text or call me and, and, uh, and if they couldn't get through to 911, that I had a direct line to the, you know, the, the, the commander of the precinct and that I could sort of help them address their problem. And that if I couldn't get that, I would drive to their location and help them myself. Yeah. Right. You know, um, as one individual, you know, I'm not incredibly superhuman. You know, you met me, I'm not incredibly tall or, you know, all that stuff, but- um, You're kind of jacked. <laughs> I, I try. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but I, I, can't, I can't be out here being like, you know, I, I, I'm not going to be Batman, right? Mm-hmm. I just don't have the capacity. Um, but uh, I don't think anyone does. 
But I'll probably be out there with my neighbors and trying to make sure that people are safe, trying to make sure that, you know, their property's not, you know, slid mm-hmm. on fire and all of that. I think there's also just this huge, you know, if you're not in Minneapolis, you know, I, I, I don't blame you for not like discerning the local geography. Right. But like for folks who maybe don't know, um, all the protests were happening miles from where I represent. Right. Right. They're happening. You're way north. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was surprised how far south George Floyd Square is. Yeah. And, and, and so that, you know, so for, and there were no protests, no marches, no, nothing happening in North mm-hmm. Minneapolis. What we had was we had these spontaneous fires that got started, um, not by crowds, not by protesters, not by activists, not by any of that. And you're talking about like AutoZone and the precinct? That was South Side. North side, we had, you know, gas stations, businesses, that kind of stuff being uh-huh. lit on fire. And so it was kind of odd, right? People were like, okay, we're not having protests over here. Why are, prop- why are things getting lit on fire? And, uh, and so there was a, you know, there were a few times, there was one time in particular where, you know, I, we got a call from a neighbor, me and my, uh, me and my, me and my friend Mike and my younger brother, we arrived at the scene of this fire before the, the fire trucks even. And we're and it's a, it was a it, it was a, a business called the Fade Factory. It's a barbershop. shop, and mm-hmm. we were just like trying to help this small business owner like put the fire out in his shop. Um, and we were unsuccessful. I just remember like pouring water, like running water hoses from people's houses, and like the heat was kind of incredible. And then all of a sudden, like the two like windows just on either side of us just shattered, and it was like we're not going to defeat this fire with these yeah. with these home ho- home. Uh, hoses, right? Um, that was what I did the first time, and and I'll continue to be out there and do stuff like that the second time. You know, I I'm not as convinced that the city. Well, maybe now that we've had Dante Wright killed um, in uh, Brooklyn Center, which is a nearby suburb. I mean, it's it's essentially right. you're, north you're in North Minneapolis, but yeah. it's like North North Minneapolis, right. and it's not technically Minneapolis. It right. has its own mayor, right. its own police force. Right, right. But I'll tell you right now that like I have constituents who you know who can who move around quite a bit, right? And you know they'll live in Minneapolis, they'll live they'll live in North Minneapolis. They might go live uh, uh, in uh, Golden Valley, which is a nearby suburb. But they're definitely going to go live in Brooklyn Park or Brooklyn Center, which uh-huh. in Brooklyn Center is where that happened. I mean, it's it's. You know, there there's there are the borders that governments create and then there are the borders that people create. And, you know, from North Minneapolis to Brooklyn Center, there's essentially no border. Right. Like right. people don't even treat it like it's different. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I still kind of consider that happening kind of basically in my neighborhood. Yeah. I'm not as convinced that, you know, there's just going to be chaos. I will say that in my experience being on the ground, the way police respond to protesters and I don't think it has to be this way, but the way they respond contributes to chaos. And when you have that kind of chaos, you're going to have all kinds of activity start to happen, right? Um, when the police consistently are claiming that they cannot distinguish between peaceful protesters and somebody who threw a water bottle mm-hmm. and they dump gas and mace and rubber bullets and flashbangs on the entire crowd, you know, there are going to be people who look at that and say, game on. Yeah, there's an opportunity here. Yeah. There are going to be people who are pissed off, who think they're in a fight for their life, and the police response is proving them right, right? Mm-hmm. But that's how they're going to feel. Yeah, they just it feeds off each other, right. right, and escalates. Right. The difference now being, of course, that the the National Guard is here, right? So that's different. What's interesting about that is at peak George Floyd protests, there was the whole kerfuffle with the mayor with Donald Trump, right? He was calling him weak mm-hmm. and you know, saying that if, if Fry didn't call in the National Guard, he was gonna do it um, because uh, you know, when the looting starts, the shooting starts, mm-hmm. right? That mm-hmm. famous tweet. Mm-hmm. And Mayor Fry didn't call in the National Guard, but now he did. Mm-hmm. And so here we are in a situation on the eve of a, a verdict being delivered in the midst of Don, the Dante Wright situation. So there is a pins and needles kind of vibe mm-hmm. everywhere you go. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, this curfew. Mm-hmm. And I know you got a lot of opinions about how curfews work to derail or curtail freedom of association and freedom of speech. Um, what is your take on you know seeing these Humvees all over town right now? Yeah, I, I, I think that it, it, 
it probably invites the very kind of ac- activity and actors that it's meant to deter, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fences certainly do that. You might as well put and the a barbed big, wire and the fences and the barricades everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. It is like a war zone. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, you know. There was somebody, uh, my guys were walking around downtown and they they bumped up against a German woman who was saying that some elderly German woman who said something along the lines of like, I haven't seen anything like this since, you know, Berlin. Yeah. I mean, it was funny right before I was just about to say, uh, I, I described to you. Uh, my sister, I was like, yeah, they literally have two two fences with barbed wire in the middle. And her response was, that's how the Berlin Wall was built. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not a great sign. Right. I, you know. And it's been um, wild to watch the, the, like I click on CNN. And first of all, it's crazy to like be here and then turn CNN on. And it's like all everything all day long is about what's happening here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's like this, even in when we were at George Floyd Square, uh, one of the guys we were with went into Cup Foods. And it's, of course, it's on in there too. Yeah. And it's like, it's so meta. Yeah. Right. And, and like strange, <laughs> like some crazy simulation. But yeah. Yeah. In the context of the Dante Wright protests, you turn on CNN and you can just hear. Like it's all about like what's going to happen when the clock ticks ten and mm-hmm. it's curfew and mm-hmm. everybody's like getting ready for some major clash mm-hmm. hasn't happened yet. Yeah, I know there's been some shit that's gone down, but in yeah. the grander scheme of things, it's mostly it's been just pretty chill. It's mostly so just the military. On like Tuesday night, there were like ten people there. <laughs> yeah, like after curfew, everybody left. Yeah, it's mostly just the police and the military right. dumping gas on people. Like you know, and and um, and I, I think that that's like I mean I, you know they. In some ways, they have to do that, right? They they predicted this 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 violent crazed fallout. People in Minneapolis and the surrounding area were going to react in this way. They prepared for months for the scenario that they wanted, which is, you know, their 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 um their opportunity to have the resources to suppress a crowd. Uh, and so when it didn't happen. They kind of had to pretend like it was happening anyway. Mm-hmm. That's and, the that's the sense that I get. Yeah, and I think it's, it's kind of sad. And for anybody who's been who was out in Brooklyn Center, um, you know, I've always had a really impression, good impression of the governor. But I saw the other day he, or maybe earlier today, time is a, is a flat circle these days. Um, he said that he believed that if the barricades hadn't gone up and the military hadn't gone out there, that the that the police precinct in Brooklyn Center um, was going to go up in flames. I can't think of a thing. I've, I, I've never heard an elected official, no matter their party, say something so more full of shit than that. Because if you're there and I was there and you're reading the room and you're, you're getting the mood of the crowd, you kind of get a sense of, of where things are at. You literally had activist leaders out there who were, you know, gently urging people to go home. Most of them did. Uh-huh. I mean, the type of people who themselves you would think would not go home were urging people to go mm. home. I mean, the tone is just people are mourning. Whatever fantasy the governor has about these rabid people who can't control their impulses, who want to burn everything down. It doesn't exist, except in his fantasy. It's usually a reaction uh, to some level of provocation. It's almost always that. I mean, it's pretty. I've only ever seen it be that. Um, but there's always going to be bad actors, though. Who have, for sure? Okay, this is it's lawless. Like nobody's going to no. You know, there's not going to be any cops showing up. So we're just going to go do what we're going to do. Yeah, for I mean, for sure, right? You're going to have people who think, okay, cool. This is an opportunity to go break into the store and steal some stuff that I could, you know, sell later or or own or whatever. Right? You're always going to have that. But to pretend like the entire crowd is that, uh, or to just say, oh, well, there's no way for us yeah. to distinguish. It's not true. And, it, and you know, I know I generally try to keep a calm demeanor, but it, it infuriates me kind of to no to no end when I see that and the and and the rhetorical violence, right? You're not seeing you you know you don't see it. He, the the governor's not seeing what he's articulating, so he has to sort of implant that image in your mind with his words. Right. That's all he has because mm-hmm. he can't show you that because it doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. He has to implant that in your mind with his words, and and a lot of a lot of elected officials govern that way, and it's just to provide some rhetorical cover when they go ahead and 
abuse, you know, our right. neighbors. I think the part of the challenge or the uphill battle that you're trying to wage is convincing a guy like that, that there's value in doing something different. Like mm-hmm. we've seen the evidence that like, every time you do it this way, this is what happens. Yeah. But if you're that guy, you're like, well. Maybe we just need more force. Yeah, it's like, it's too risky. You know what I mean? If he's, if he's trying to you know, please his constituents or sure. whoever he is answering to in sure. that regard. It's like, I know if I do this, it might not go so good, but this is what we do. And so I can, if take I, do comfort, something different, yeah. I can take comfort in that. Whereas if I go out on a limb and say, we're not gonna do any of that. We're gonna allow these protesters to like do their thing. And I promise you, it's gonna be chill mm-hmm. and something goes sideways. Then it's like, and oh, that dude's you were... head is on a stick. Sure, sure. I mean, one is I'm not advocating that when tensions are high that you do nothing, right? Mm-hmm. I do think that when you have folks like myself or folks like, you know, Steve Fletcher, Lisa Bender, you know, these are my colleagues on the council. When you have like a handful of folks advocating that we do it differently, right? And we've never done it differently before, but we think that mm-hmm. if we all engaged our, our collective imagination and we all engage our, common, our collective common sense, that we could probably do something pretty good. But when you got three, five, seven, yeah. nine people and then you have the governor, the com- you know the commissioner of public safety, the police chief of the city of various cities, and the uh, the the the, the Hennepin County Sheriff, all saying we're going to do it this way, and you're like, okay, I think we should do it differently, and they're like, well, how? You have like you, you we collectively thought of this mm-hmm. really abusive response, and it took all of us all of our brains together, working together to think of this really abusive response, but, but, the, un, but the non-abusive response, the one that, does, that isn't rooted in violence, you've got to come up with that on your own. If we don't like it, we're just going to tell you you're crazy. Right, I mean, that's, that's the criticism that gets hurled at you. Like, oh, you want this different way. <laughs> well, show us what that is. And you, know, you haven't come up with that right. in and, specifics. And, tr- and the truth is that in, in a lot of ways I have, right? When it comes yeah. to thinking out this Department of Public Safety and the ways that we should examine safety and, and, and proceed forward, that I've half thought out. Mm-hmm. When it comes to how you uh, de-escalate a crowd that is full of raw emotion, um, I've got some ideas. I do think that it would be worthwhile for me to vet those ideas with other smart people, and you know, have my ideas challenged and and shaped and into a plan, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I, th- I think and that- shouldn't that involve <laughs> like an organizational psychologist or like somebody who <laughs> understands like you know it the, should at least the appropriate. Yeah, um, response right. to to diffuse tense right. emotions. Right. It should at least involve yeah. the governor. Right. Yeah, it should at least right, involve yeah. the mayor. Right. And 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 it doesn't involve even those parts. Like you know, I think the 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 standard is crazy. Right. Like like they come to get they they understand the value of of collective imagination. They all worked together to collectively imagine this plan that they're executing. That's going really badly. Right. Mm-hmm. But tradition has momentum. But tradition has yeah. momentum. And the expectation is that if you want to do it differently, that you've got to come up with that on your own. We did it together. We use the power of collaboration. Oh, but what you want to collaborate? That's no, that, that just means that you don't know what you're doing. Um, and so the standards mm-hmm. for uh, the standards are just different and, and they're, you know, to a ridiculous degree. Yeah. So who is getting it right? Like, is there a model out there of a city that's executing in a way that you think Minneapolis could aspire to emulate? I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't know that any city government is getting it right. What about internationally? Like any any places in Europe or, you know, I mean, their relationship to policing is completely different. Yeah, it is completely different. They, their gun laws are different. You know, they, you know mm-hmm. I, I think that they've built a system that they can sustain, right? Uh, and, you know, I think there's a whole host of reasons why maybe it would be difficult to copy that, right? I do think that, like, when you look at what other cities have done around doing a better job of ensuring housing and addressing homelessness, right? And, but it's not just homelessness because the homeless, quite frankly, are not the ones out here committing most crimes, right? It's people who might be housed, but are financially insecure. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, 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 and completely and, disenfranchised. And disenfranchised and, you know, your, your, your options for them are that they can 
starve to death or they can go out and try to create a little bit of opportunity for themselves and they're opting to live, right? Um, maybe in a way that harms others and, and that's not okay, but you also haven't, we also haven't set some people up mm-hmm. for success. I think that, you know, there are some folks who are starting, I think, you know, I keep using the phrase, ask the question. It's not like a slogan or anything. I'm just, it's just kind of how the conversation evolves. But like, I think there are some folks who are asking the right questions, right? Uh, Mayor Myrick in Ithaca, New York, is like asking the right questions. He's actually taking this Department of Public Safety concept. I don't know. That, I don't necessarily know that he got it from us, but mm-hmm. he um, he's certainly moving much faster than us in trying to execute something like that, right? And uh, uh, and I certainly think that like folks like. You know, um, it's too bad that like Michael Tubbs, you know, ended up losing his election because, you know, instituting things like, you know, universal basic income and and experimenting and figuring out how we can do Mm -hmm. those kinds of policies. I think they start to erase some of the reasons that Mm -hmm. people might engage. Yeah, you create a a bedrock, a foundation that you can build upon. Right. But I feel like that was one initiative that has succeeded in becoming a productive part of the national conversation Mm -hmm. and no small part due to Andrew Yang. I mean, he's the one who really kind of- Yeah, on the presidential stage. Into into prominence and it's now being, you know, reasonably considered in a way that a couple of years ago, people would have thought it was insane. It was totally crazy. Yeah, right, right. You know, I think what we're finding with policing is that no response is actually going to amount to safety if people are- insecure in their housing, insecure in their work, insecure in, you know, how they feed themselves, right? The system we have can enact some brutality on people who are perceived as committing harm, but often enacts plenty of brutality on people who aren't even perceived to be committing harms. It just enacts brutality on them. So I think that a real path is going to have to be a mix of us realizing that housing and, you know, how people earn their living and safety are not siloed, you know, subjects, subject yeah. matter, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that we sort of have to engage these other forms as we change our emergency responses. And I think that what we're going to find is that for folks who uh, were out there maybe selling drugs or doing whatever kind of, you know, thing that, that we, we might see as harmful to, mm-hmm. to our communities, mm-hmm. uh, that now we give them an out, and we're not, we don't, they don't have an out right now. Yeah. And, and then what we're going to find is that, you know, uh, the person who has, you know, bipolar disorder and they're having an episode or, or whatever, whatever, the, whatever's going on, that if we can admit to ourselves that a cop showing up with a gun, pointing their gun at that person and screaming at them doesn't actually it's, it's help not, them. Yeah, it's not, it's not productive. <laughs> it's not productive. I mean, I think another issue that will, like, if this becomes a thing that you'll have to contend with is the difference between conceptualization and execution. Oh, for sure. Like I'm thinking of um, child services, for example. Yeah, like right, right, right. the idea of child services is very well-intentioned, like mm-hmm, to protect mm-hmm. these kids, but then it becomes abused and misused and yep. you know, kids are getting yanked out of houses that shouldn't get yanked out. Sure. Like, you know what I mean? Like all sorts of stuff can go haywire with this right, stuff. Right, the, right. the minute you start creating all of these bureaucracies. But I, I actually think that it's the, I think that it is our punitive inclination that, that, that actually creates that, right? That, to me, that starts with, I mean, that is a- Well, that's, that, you mean, it, you could, that traces all the way back to systemic racism in, yeah. in that regard. Like, what is the intention when you're knocking on that door and you're like, what are you expecting to see? What is your bias going into that situation? Right. And right. what are the expectations or your quota or whatever your yeah. boss is telling you? For sure. I mean, we've had, you know, I think by and large, you know, people will find that they'd much rather interact with like an EMT or a firefighter than a police officer. But- you know, I've heard from constituents that they feel like they've been assaulted by EMTs, right? And so, you know, when when if if an EMT is showing up to a scene with the mentality of a police officer, if a child protection worker is showing up to that knocking on that door with the mentality of a police officer, then you're going to get sort of that right. punitive approach. And to if the they work. know they're being dispatched in lieu of police, though, that could lead to that mentality. I don't know that that's true. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I mean, I'm not saying it's not true. I just don't. Right. I don't know for sure. Right? If that 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 right. would be one of those well, assumptions it's, it's, that we would. It's have not to a vet. reason to. It's not a reason to not try. Right. Right. You know? And it's one of those assumptions that we would have to really vet. Right. Mm-hmm. Um. And I mean, we're seeing that. Like, 
look, the, the violence interrupters, and even before we had, because the, the violence interrupters are pretty new. Even before we had the violence interrupters, we had what's called GVI caseworkers. This is group violence intervention caseworkers. You know, these guys, they're, they're not approaching, you know, these are men and women who aren't approaching their work with that sort of punitive, like, I got to catch somebody in the act, or I got yeah. to gotta, gotta wag my finger and, and, and strict discipline, or I got to, you know, this is not how they approach the work, right? And so I think that it's possible to create emergency responses uh, that, do, that do, by and large, have the intended outcome that you mm-hmm. want, right? Mm-hmm. Now, you know, anything that you don't put a lot of care into, a lot of investment into, is probably not going to function very well. So we're going to have to make sure that, you know, that these are not trends that come and go, right? That, you know, we tried that, it worked, but... The problem's not as prevalent mm-hmm. now, so we're gonna go ahead and give all that money back to the police. Um, if that's the outcome, then yeah, I mean, we, I think we can pretty much count on these cycles continuing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting down with the mayor tomorrow, mm-hmm. and I know you guys don't see eye to eye on 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 everything, but you seem to have you seem to have a rapport. Yeah, you guys get along and everything. Um, what do you think? Like, what should I ask him? Like, what would you like me to ask him? What What would you like me to hear his answer on? You know, I think you're gonna be better at this stuff than me. Um, but, you know, there is one question I feel like has gone really unanswered. You know, there was this report by the U of M that talked about the misuse of less lethal rounds um, throughout the country. Mm-hmm. And, but, you know, the, the start of their research was here locally. Um, you know, things like, you know, five year olds that had nothing to, you know, them, their parents, they weren't at the protest. They're, you know, we had a fire struck with a rubber bullet, skull had received a skull fracture. People who were hit with canisters, you know, tear gas canisters or, you know, flashbang canisters, right? That you, you would have to literally be aiming at their head in order for that to really happen. Journalists blinded, right? Mm-hmm. I'm, you don't have to ask them the specifics about these yeah. cases because these things are all going to get litigated. But, you know, there was a time during the protest after George Floyd was killed where, you know, yeah, the crowds were upset, but the response from the police was excessive. And I don't think that it could, be, but it, it could not be described by any reasonable, per, reasonable person who was there as anything other than excessive. And if my memory is serving me correctly, it was two days of just excessive police force on protesters before, you, before the auto zone went on fire, uh-huh. right? And so to me, in my mind, that's two days where and you could it, have- But at that point, there's no chance for de-escalation. When the auto zone's on fire, yeah. no. But you had two days before that. Yeah, You had two days before that to, to, to address the situation and to do something differently, right? Instead of pushing these protesters, creating a chaotic situation in which non-protesters felt welcomed and then pushing the crowds back into the businesses that aren't protected by you. Right, mm-hmm. you push them. You literally push them back into the neighborhood and into the businesses that are not protect, being protected mm-hmm. by you right now. And so, you know, a lot of folks when they look at that report, all the misuse, all the excessive violence that happened during the protests. I mean, the state's lawsuit uh, against the city of Minneapolis, against MPD for a pattern and practice of discrimination is not because of what happened to George Floyd. It's because of how police acted during the protests. Right? right. You know, there there's been this question hanging of like. Did the mayor and the chief approve of this conduct or was the chain of command broken? Were rank and file officers going rogue? Mm-hmm. And, and we don't know. And we, and we, we don't, don't know. know. And I think, uh-huh. that, I think that the mayor and the chief have successfully avoided that question. And quite honestly, they've reaped the, ve- the benefits of having no answer to that question. Because if they maintained full control, but also somehow didn't condone the conduct that occurred... Well, you know, that, that means that they both made all the right decisions and that they deserve to stay in control of the system. Right, but there's no political benefit in answering that question. Sure, them. but I, yeah. I, think that it's, I think that there's a benefit to, to asking the question. And I, I, you know, now that I'm saying you have to ask them that uh-huh. question tomorrow, uh, <laughs> that'd be a hostile question to ask, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Uh, but, <laughs> I gotta think about that. But, um, but I do think that, um, you know, I do think that the... the the answer to that question matters, not because it would hurt the mayor politically, right? Mm -hmm. Or the chief or whatever, right? I I, I don't care about that. But every road to change 
has to start with an acknowledgement, right? And if we cannot have an acknowledgement of what did and didn't occur, then I don't know how we change. Right, you gotta have the reckoning. Right. 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 As a, as a, as a starting point. Right. That being said though, I feel like his position on police reform, he's not willing to go as far as you would like to go, mm -hmm. but he's fully acknowledging that the system is broken and need, is, in, is in significant need of, of dramatic repair. While at the same time, not changing his response to protests, uh -huh. not changing his approach to that broken system. You know, you can change the wording on the use of force document which, you know, had been rewritten pretty well in just in 2016, right? Mm -hmm. You can do some of these things that on paper look totally fine. They look like the right thing to do. And then but Brooklyn it takes, Center erupts and then just whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. Yeah, dump gas on them, right? If we're not, you know, you can say this system is deeply broken, but we're gonna surround the build, we're gonna surround all these buildings with, with, uh, with fences and barbed wire. We're not gonna take the time to understand why the crowd reacted the way it reacted. And we're certainly not gonna admit that we played any role in that, right? I think one of the most valuable things about, you know, um, that, that the movie of the trial of the Chicago 7, I brought it up earlier, is that, you know, um, and one of the values of reading Kerner Commission, you know, uh, McCone Commission, the Commission on Race Relations, the Illinois Commission on Race Relations from 1919. One of the values that you get is that, you know, when you vet history, a lot of the major riots once studied are determined to have been started by the police. Mm -hmm. Well, they, yeah, I mean, that movie does a great job of showing how that all came to be. Right. And it's, it's just history repeating itself and repeating itself. Right. And so you say there's a problem, but then when you see the problem and we say like this, like this is the problem, you go, no, no, this is no, mm -hmm. we're going to keep doing it this way. I think that that is... You know, I, I think that it's caused problems. And after the death of Jamar Clark, that was sort of when this initial wave that we're now, re, you know, sort of remixing mm -hmm. this initial wave of reforms, you know, re rewriting the use of force and de-escalation, all that stuff. Um, that initial wave came, came then, right? Mm -hmm. We did all the stuff that we were supposed to do. The city did. I wasn't in an office, but like the city did all the stuff it was supposed to do about re with, with regards to reform then, Right. Um, and it was like, here we go. Again. And here we go here again, we go. right? And and we're and we're rewriting the same. We're taking the same documents that we rewrote in sixteen, and we're rewriting them now. You know, different mayor, different chief. Um, but um, and and I think that that's the one thing that I wish the mayor and the chief would understand is that admitting the failures of this current system, asking the questions demanding some real change is not a reflection of them because they didn't build this, mm -hmm. but they are, you know, sort of, they have invested in the maintenance of it. And I believe that they shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, it's a valid point. It's, it's, it's certainly not, um, I mean, it's politically verboten let alone expedient, right, to admit that. But I do think, like, I'm a huge believer in the power of vulnerability. And I think that level of honesty to like own, you know, do an inventory and actually own, you know, your side of the street and how that contributed to what transpired just engenders so much trust. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you have to play the long game, mm -hmm. right? And if you're a politician, you're always looking at the next election cycle. But I if mean, you can broaden that, you don't that have to though, bit. right? Yeah, Michael Tubbs is thirty, right? I'm thirty one. I was like, I was like, man, this guy's younger than me. Uh, but like, <laughs> Michael Tubbs is. 30. Are you the youngest city council member currently? Yeah, currently, I yeah. think that'll was, change. That'll change right, next yeah. next next election cycle. Uh -huh. I think some good some good young folks are going to win. But like, um, but yeah, I'm currently the youngest, and like, you know, he rose to mayor, and I think in in in, a, in the city that he lived in, and I think it could be easy. But I think it'd be a mistake to say like, oh, this is a quick rise and fall, right? Mm -hmm. the guy's 30. He's got the rest of his life to make an impact. And like from everything I've seen from him, he's going to, right? I think that if I had to lose an election because I advocated for a homeless shelter, for example, I could live with that. If I had to lose an election because 
I fought for more affordable housing because I fought to create a system that actually kept people safe, more safe than the one now, right? If I had to lose an election for those reasons, like, so be it. I could live with that forever. I'll go back to paint murals, Mm -hmm. right? You know, some of us are lucky enough to be incredibly young in this job. And if we had to lose an election because we did the right thing in a moment that demanded that we do the right thing, then like, what's the real loss, right? Well, yeah, in the arc of history bends towards justice. Like ultimately in, you know, that is playing the long game because, you know, you'll find yourself in some other situation where you'll, you know, be fine. Yeah. Or yeah. get reelected or, or whatever. Right. But what does it look like for you? Are you in, you in this for the, like, what's, what's it look like 10 years from now? Are you in this game for I good? I, you know, I think it's really important that I play the role I'm, I'm being asked to play by my community right now. Mm-hmm. I think, you know. That's such a politician answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, I'll put it this way. I'm like, not thinking about that. I'm just thinking about. <laughs> I mean, I'll put it this Come way. On. I mean, I came into this, I got elected when I was 27. Yeah. And I don't plan on doing this job till I'm 77. I think that there's some real interesting things that I've been able to create in the last three plus years. And I think there's some real interesting things, you know, and I'm not just talking about public safety. I'm talking Mm -hmm. about, you know, economic development. I mean, you know, for years, people in North Minneapolis have talked about, okay, in the black community, number one issue is access to capital. And I created this fund that gave folks access to capital. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing small businesses buy their buildings. Right. So now there's ownership within the community. Right. Instead of landlords who live on the other side of town. Sometimes not even in this, in the country. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so like, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm really getting some things right because I'm willing to dig into the weeds and I'm willing to respect, you know, the, the expertise of some of our staff and at the same time, learn what they know and try to push them as best as I can, right? Um, to do better on housing, to do better on this, to do, to create these, these interesting things. But I am a firm believer that when your time is up, it's better to, you know, sort of relinquish the mic than to have it snatched from you. And so, you know, I think that if I'm not looking around my community and saying, you know, who are all the brilliant people that I know could do this job, right? Who are all those people? But they would never do it because nobody ever told them that they could be a city There's council a member, right? Like, you know, they would never do it because nobody ever asked them, right? People always ask, like, no offense to attorneys, I'm, you know, blood related to a bunch of people uh-huh. always ask, like, the businessman or the attorney to run for office, right? They're not asking the artist. They're mm-hmm. not asking the youth worker. They're not asking the sanitation engineer who probably knows more about problems in the city, you know, than, than anybody else, right? And so, like, to me, you know, a part of my job is to look around me, look at my surroundings and say, who else could do this job um, and serve their community? Whether they're older than me, younger than me, doesn't matter. I think one of the things that we fail to do and I guess the we here is I'm talking about, you know, uh, you know, young progressives and progressives electeds and maybe electeds in general is that we don't invest in in people's leadership. Right. We sort of just like mm-hmm. allow leadership to manifest in whatever way. And then we and then we, you know, sort of hit the lottery and, you know, and maybe this person. Right. right. Um, well, it's 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 a lot easier and a lot more fun to just criticize politicians. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. You know, I, yeah, for sure. And that's fine. You're going to be criticized. I hope, I hope whoever I, I, I hope whatever, you know, young leaders that I, I, I'm, I'm investing in, I hope that the one thing I can pass on to them is, is, is to have really thick skin. Um, a lot of people have done this job badly, right? A lot of people have caused harm in these positions, right? There's several council members even who like, you know, you'll still see them around town who like, you know, they left office because they took bribes, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of people have caused harms in these positions, have caused harm in this in these positions. And so and so you better have thick skin because, you know, your neighbors deserve at least that. Yeah. You know. Uh so uh so yeah. I, I don't know how long I'll do this. I, mm-hmm. I I um I feel a lot of purpose in this work and I feel pretty good at it. Uh I don't know that I enjoy it. <laughs> but well, I, <laughs> I mean, you know, look, man, it, fe- it feels like you got a pretty good grip on it. Like, yeah. I think you're in the right lane. I'm sure you're itching to pick up a paintbrush. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you still do that in your free time or if you have any free time. I, I mean, if you were going to, if you were, if you could do a mural right now, what, what would you like, what would that look like? What, what would that mural be? Oh man, right this second, I've, uh, 
I would probably want to do something that had nothing to do with any of this. I probably yeah. like want to just paint like a huge like Silver Surfer like <laughs> on, like on the side of a building, <laughs> just like. Is that your guy? I, I love Silver Surfer. I yeah. think I think I think he's great. Uh, one of my favorite favorite comics. But you know, I'd probably want to. You know, I'm not even sure if I'd have the energy to paint a mural right now. You know, it, it could be fr- pretty physically. I never quite realized how physically involved mural making was. But you know, you're building scaffolding mm-hmm. every day, and you're climbing this thing, you're climbing down, and days are usually hot in Minnesota. The days can be really can be pretty hot. So I'm like, I don't even know if I'd have the energy to paint a mural right now. I gotta it's not get hot shape. Out, it's not hot out it's right not now. Hot, it's not hot out right yeah. now. <laughs> That's funny because I would have thought, oh, you'd have this perfectly grafted like idea of this political, politically oh, man, charged no. mural that you know, you'd want to go paint down at George you, Floyd Square. You, you know what I would want to do right now? I, you know, I, I would, I probably could write a pretty good season of Fargo right now. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like giving everything. Trust me, we- <laughs> it's hard to not visit here and not think about. I actually just watched that movie like two weeks ago. Again. Have you seen the show at all? Yeah, the show's yeah, pretty yeah. good. It's good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Uh, anyway. And the Chris, the the, the latest um, season with Chris Rock. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's really good. Season two's probably still just like the mm-hmm. best. But um, they're, they're all so different. Yeah, they're all really you know? different. But, but it's yeah. all the same vibe. Yeah, I wouldn't have time to do it, but yeah, I could probably write a pretty good season of Fargo right now. All right. Well, good, man. Good talking to you. Yeah, thank you. How thank do you, you feel? Feel all right? Yeah, you got to get good. some food in you. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go eat some more. I think a couple dates. That's, that's, that's <laughs> not going to do it A couple for you, dates, a couple oranges. Yeah, no. Um, cool, man. I appreciate you talking to me. And uh, best of luck winning your sales. Yeah, my thank friend. you. Thanks. Peace. Lance. Thanks for listening, everybody. For links and resources related to everything discussed today, visit the show notes on the episode page at richroll.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, the easiest and most impactful thing you can do is to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and on YouTube. Sharing the show or your favorite episode with friends or on social media is, of course, always appreciated. And finally, for podcast updates, special offers on books, the meal planner, and other subjects, subscribe to our newsletter, which you can find on the footer of any page on richroll.com. Today's show was produced and engineered by Jason Camiolo. The video edition of the podcast was created by Blake Curtis. Portraits by Allie Rogers and Davey Greenberg. Graphic elements courtesy of Jessica Miranda. Copywriting by Georgia Whaley. And our theme music was created by Tyler Pyatt, Trapper Pyatt, and Harry Mathis. You can find me at richroll.com or on Instagram and Twitter at richroll. I appreciate the love. I love the support. I don't take your attention for granted. Thank you for listening. See you back here soon. Peace. Plants. Namaste.